Why should the narcissist attend therapy? What's wrong? Maybe he's just an a-hole or a jerk, or maybe like Len Sperry says, he has a narcissistic style, but not a full-fledged narcissistic personality disorder. So why should he waste resources, his time, his money, on utterly unnecessary treatments? I thought that I would give someone else the right to speak for a change. It's a woman who had written to me. Hello, Sam. I'm watching many of your recent videos, indeed, as I type. I had to pause halfway through one to write to you. How the narcissist sees you as two women. Nothing has hit that bullseye with such clarity. I have to tell you that I have written before, at the beginning of leaving my fragile or covert narcissistic partner. I thought I had enough resources to keep me determined in my run to the hills. I failed. Seven months later, we reunited. We then married. Ah, the delicious blaring of reality in that back-to-the-start phase of our resurrected relationship. <clears throat> I thought to myself, how did I ever doubt this man? He loves me. He's so generous and kind and present. He falls on one knee in a Hebridean sunset and proposes. Of course the answer was yes. Slowly, ever so slowly, like the proverbial frog in that pot of water brought to boil, I wake up after three more years and realize nothing has changed. That feeling of being invisible, that old niggle of disconnection, feeling as though I'm irrelevant. I mean nothing to him. That void. He can't physically touch me. No laughter, no joy. He's like a kettle, furiously boiling inside, where you can see the lid jumping, but you know you will be scalded if you try to remove it. The verbal abuse where he totally lacerates my character, wounds me deeply. It's as though I'm merely a household appliance, functional. I attempt to discuss how I feel and he reacts with disinterest at best, at worst, fury. My feelings just don't matter. He is the hero, the provider. We both work, by the way. How dare I put him down when he's working so hard? I feel ugly, insecure, pointless and completely invisible. I know this is not true, of course, but I feel this in his company. I feel completely stuck. I would, not, I would not like just to be free. This has gone on for 13 years. I constantly tell myself, ah, but he was kind to me then, he bought me a meal out, we had that holiday, etc. And I end up flailing between extremes. Please feel free to quote my email if my words make others go, me too and recognize that insidious sorcery, that submersion into the frog pan enough to act. That's good. My previous partner was a grandiose narcissist. It was evident who he was as he crashed around center stage. There was nothing underhand about his aggression, like blowing a trumpet in your face. This one, however, is like walking barefoot in lush grass, not seeing the snake. How do we get here? Well, more to the point, how do we escape? I mean, truly escape. I think this letter speaks for himself. The narcissist inflicts insurmountable, harrowing suffering on everyone around him. And I'm not only referring to insignif insignificant others or to non-intimate partners. I'm referring to his business associates, his neighbors, Everyone around him suffers one way or another. Ultimately, the narcissist himself sets himself up for failure. His standards of perfection can never be attained, so he's constantly dissatisfied and tortured. And then, when he does succeed, he sabotages his own success, he undermines, he self-defeats, he self-destructs because of his inner critic, sadistic superego. The narcissist is the narcissist's largest, biggest victim. 
The narcissist tends to regard the therapeutic relationship as yet another shared fantasy. And here too, within the therapy, the narcissist confuses internal and external objects via a process called transference. He transfers his internal objects, he projects them onto the therapist. Some of these internal objects are parental figures. So he begins to treat the therapist or regard the therapist as a surrogate father or surrogate mother. And there is um, an almost psychotic confusion in the first stages of therapy. My name is Sam Vakni. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and your professor of psychology. Today I'm going to offer you an overview of the psychotherapies and treatment modes and modalities that had been proven to work with cluster B personality disorders, most notably narcissistic, antisocial, um, and borderline personality disorders. I have omitted purposefully, on purpose, a few of these therapies. For example, I will not analyze or mention EMDR, which is a form of cognitive behavior therapy coupled with eye movements. Generally, I will not dwell on body-mind therapies, although in the case of EMDR, for example, there's a good track record with cluster B. Still, I'm excluding body-centered therapies. I'm also excluding humanist, humanistic therapies, Carl Rogers. I'm excluding transactional analysis. I'm excluding all psychodynamic therapies and psychoanalysis, etc., etc. And the reason I'm doing all this is because there is insufficient data to prove or to show or to demonstrate conclusively or even just convincingly that these therapies, with the, with the exception of, of EMDR and to some extent Gestalt, that these therapies are efficacious with cluster B. So I'm going to focus only on therapies backed by studies and published peer-reviewed papers. Now, I encourage you to do your own research. Go and read, um, go and read on EMDR, EMDR, go and read on Gestalt therapy, go even and read on psychodynamic or therapies or psychoanalytic psychotherapy. It's all, these are all laudable therapies and they make claims. Regrettably, these claims are not supported by research. So now, evidence-based therapies. First of all, I refer you again to Len Sperry's S-P-E-R-R-Y uh, book, Handbook of Diagnosis and Treatment of, Di of DSM-5 Personality Disorders, Assessment, Case Conceptualization and Treatment, published by Rutledge in 2016. It's the third edition. Previous two relate to the DSM-4 text revision. This one incorporates the latest insights and changes in the DSM-5. And on we go. We start with behavior therapy. Behavior therapy is a group of therapies, actually, which replace problem behaviors with constructive behaviors via conditioning, or more precisely, counter-conditioning and reinforcement. So they use very primitive tools of operant conditioning and reinforcement, positive and negative reinforcement, to sort of channel the patient towards more constructive, more productive, uh, less, ab less abrasive and less antisocial behaviors. There's a whole family and they date back to the 1950s. Out of behavior therapy, this, there came a second family of therapies. They are known as cognitive therapies. Cognitive therapies seek to change negative automatic thoughts and, and, sh and schemas that lead to attributional and other biases, as well as to errors in thinking. So cognitive therapy focuses on, as the name implies, cognition. Cognition, how to change your thinking. By changing your thinking, you change your frame of mind. You change your frame of mind, you change your state of mind. Remember, all these therapies are used extensively in the treatment of personality disorders, and more specifically in the treatment of cluster B personality disorders. Now, the idea in cognitive therapy 
is to alter, to change problematic behaviors and dysfunctional feelings and behaviors by focusing on the way you think about yourself, the way you think about others, and the way you think about the world. It seems that your thinking shapes, molds your behavioral choices, and these create reactions, and the, the whole conglomerate, the whole complex generates negative emotions. So there's a vicious cycle. Negative emotions create actions, create reactions, create negative emotions, and it's a self-perpetuating, self-enhancing vicious cycle. The latest, uh, the penultimate reiteration of cognitive therapy is, of course, the, the world-famous cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT. There is a third wave of behavior therapy. It's a, it's a wave that combines CBT with other elements. What are these other elements? Number one, the primacy of the therapeutic relationship. The therapeutic relationship for the duration of the therapy becomes the main relationship of the patient, overriding even his intimate relationship, overriding his workplace, overriding anything. The therapeutic relationship becomes the main relationship because it is within the ther therapeutic relationship that change is induced. Actually, it's the relationship itself that creates the change. By having, finally, a healthy relationship with another adult who happens to be a therapist, the personality disordered person experiences a panoply of new uh, experiences. So, secure attachment, he feels safe, he can express negative affectivity and negative emotionality without being punished, he can he can be dysfunctional. The therapist will contain him and channel him and regulate him, so he acquires regulation, etc. The, the primary therapeutic relationship is a prototype for a healthy, functional relationship. A prototype, a platform, a template that the patient can then take and apply to all his other relationships. Remember, we are talking about third wave of behavior therapy, combining CBT, with other elements. We'll discuss a few of these therapies shortly. The second principle in the third wave is learning, analyzing triggers, analyzing environmental cues, exploring schemas. We'll discuss schemas a bit later. Exploring emotions. And then the third element is utilizing modeling, homework, and imagery. Now, okay, all these principles are now abstract. I'm going to show you how they are manifested, how they are used in specific therapies. And let's start with my favorite by far, dialectical behavior therapy. Dialectical behavior therapy was developed by Marshall Linehan in 1993. Recently, several elements were added to it. For example, spirituality, mindfulness. Not for me. I think it's a contamination a contamination of the original. The original was bright and brilliant. There was no need to combine, combine it with new age in order to make it more marketable and to increase profits. So I regret this development, not only in DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, but in numerous other, for example, in schema therapy, they also have mindfulness schema therapy and so on. These are Indian gurus and mystics translated via Western gurus and, and wannabe yogis who didn't understand a word of the of the original Indian teaching, and it's a bloody mess. So I'm going to describe the original dialectical behavior theory. Linehan developed it, developed it in 1993 to treat borderline personality disorders. But gradually, over the decades, the efficacy of DBT had been proven with other personality disorders and with disorders of mood, anxiety, eating disorders, and substance abuse disorders. So it is widely, widely applied to a variety of disorders. But the experience hitherto has been almost exclusively with female patients, and in large part in inpatient or residential settings. In other words, in hospital settings, mental asylum settings, to be less politically correct. 
people committed or hospitalized, women committed or hospitalized, have undergone um, dialectical behavior therapy. So at this stage, we have no proof that it would be useful or applicable to men or to children. I have just come up with a new diagnosis for men, suggested diagnosis for men, covert borderline. If I'm right, the covert borderline is a combination of antisocial, narcissist and borderline, typical mostly to men, not to women. This would explain why DBT doesn't work well with men or has, hadn't been applied to men. Because men happen to, men uh, gravitate more towards the primary psychopathy pole, while women gravitate more towards the secondary psychopathy pole. In other words, women borderline, women borderlines would tend to become secondary psychopaths under conditions of stress. And men covert borderlines would tend to become primary psychopaths under the same conditions, for example, anticipating rejection, humiliation and abandonment. Um, or going through actual breakup or disintegration of an interpersonal, meaningful interpersonal relationship. So there is a substantial difference between the way a borderline personality disorder is expressed and manifested in men and the way it is expressed and manifested in women, which would explain why DBT is much more efficacious with women. DBT emphasizes emotional and affect regulation not cognitions. It in this sense diverges from classic cognitive therapy and goes back, harks, harkens back to the very beginning of behavior therapy when it was combined with emotive therapy. So it is concerned, DBT is concerned with how your schema, how the schemas of the patients were formed via dialectical conflicts. Schemas are simply combinations of beliefs, cognitions, emotions. When you put them together in reaction to a set of specific circumstances or a relationship is a set of specific circumstances and we have schemas that pertain, for example, to relationships. We will deal with schemas at length a bit later. But DBT is asking the question, how did your schemas form? How how did um, how did you how was your affect how were your emotions involved in generating these schemas? DBT seeks to connect affect and need because every schema responds to a need and involves emotions. So we have schema, need, affect, emotions, and DBT tries to connect all of them. And there, DBT tries to demonstrate to the patient that there are processes of inference, deduction, analysis, there are belief systems which, which put together with the need and the effect had generated the schema. So suddenly everything becomes clear. You had a need, you had a belief, uh, you had a reasoning process or a logical or analytical process, deductive process, inductive process, you had some process of thinking, cognitive process. And when you put everything together, you came up with a solution. And this, this solution is a, is a scheme or multiple solutions, a schema. So when these are reinterpreted, when you become self-aware of these background processes, this self-awareness begins to generate healing. DBT identifies fixation or perseveration, example, rumination caused by early developmental deprivation and by protective in, uh, attentional constriction. So as a child, you've been deprived, for example, of maternal love in case you had a dead mother. And you have learned gradually as a, as, a, as a borderline personality disorder patient, you had learned gradually to react to this deprivation by kind of mentally insisting, by getting fixated by being unable to move on until the issue is resolved, until your needs are met. You all, we all know these insistent children who keep nagging and nagging until they get what they want. 
because they feel deprived. Similarly, you develop protective attentional constriction. You filter out a lot of data and information because they're too painful, they're too hurtful. They threaten your inner precarious balance because you are emotionally dysregulated. You're very vulnerable. You don't have an outer protective armor or shield or skin. DBT examines the effects of negative reinforcement through emotional avoidance or, or in other ways, and also studies inadequate coping skills. DBT claims that negative reinforcement, emotional avoidance, inadequate coping skills, they are actually rewarded. There's something called partial reinforcement effect. I will not go to it right now. But they are actually gratifying things. While in healthy people, emotional avoidance, inadequate coping skill is cause for, for distress. Healthy people don't like it. Borderlines actually do like it. And not only borderlines. We're talking about cluster B, but mostly borderlines. Now, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, which is used mostly for borderline, involves individual therapy, group skills training, reskilling, you acquire new skills, phone contact to shore you over, you know, in between sessions, and therapist consult consultation, which is not for you, it's for your therapist. Exactly like in psychoanalysis, your therapist consults other therapists. Actually, a typical DBT process involves, as a minimum, two therapists. One supervises the other, so to speak, consults the other. DBT focuses on using validation and problem solving to counter severe behavioral discontrol, issues of quiet desperation, problems of life, of living, and to reduce the borderline's perception, self-perception, as incomplete, incapable of experiencing happiness and joy, for example missing, broken, damaged goods. This is DBT. DBT is an exceedingly successful therapy. It has immediate effects um, on borderline patients. Well over 50% of borderline patients within the first year of DBT lose the diagnosis. The DBT, uh, borderline can no longer be diagnosed in these people. The next therapy I would like to discuss is Cognitive Behavior Analysis System of Psychotherapy, or CBASP. It was developed by McCullough and adopted by Sperry. It is not to be used with BBT. It's dangerous. Exactly like cold therapy that we're going to discuss at the end, this is a therapy which is dangerous for borderline patients. The clients of CBASP uh, learn to analyze life situations and manage daily stressors, stressful events. They evaluate, evaluate which thoughts, which behaviors prevent them from accomplishing desired outcomes. So it's a very, very pragmatic kind of therapy, more like, I would say, management consultancy. It, and it, there are two processes, two stages. One is called elicitation and the other is called remediation. Uh, in the elicitation phase, the therapist asks the patient questions about the situation, the client's role and functioning within the situation, and the desired outcome. And then the therapist demonstrates to the client that his behaviors, even his cognitions, were counterproductive, prevented him from accomplishing the desired outcome. And this leads to a revision of these self-defeating behaviors and cognition, cognition. Of course, there's an underlying assumption that every client and every patient is not masochistic, is not self-defeating, is not self-destructive by nature, is not self trashing that every person seeks his own best interests. That's not always true with cluster B personalities. At any rate, one thing the therapy does for sure is it replaces emotional reasoning with consequential, logical, analytical reasoning. And that's a major achievement because many cluster B personalities engage in emotional reasoning. The next therapy is mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, MBCT. It was developed by Tisdale. It fosters 
Awareness. Focus on thoughts, feelings and experiences in the present with an attitude of acceptance and without analysis even. Not only without judgment, but without analysis. Now, MBCT had become, in, as I said earlier, had become a module, if you wish. Um, some of its techniques became integrated into dialectical behavior therapy, EMDR even, uh, schema therapy and so on. Next therapy is pattern-focused psychotherapy. It was developed by, by Sperry himself. Uh, Sperry defined pattern as a predictable, consistent, self-perpetuating style of thinking, feeling, acting, coping, and self-defense. It can be, a pattern can be adaptive and encourage you to be competent, to be self-efficacious, to leverage your agency to secure favorable outcomes from your environment. But the pattern can be maladaptive. It could be, be inflexible, ineffective, inappropriate. And if it is maladaptive, it causes symptoms. It impairs your functioning in a variety of settings, including interpersonal relationships. And it, it reduces your satisfaction with yourself and with your life. A state called dysphoria. It generates dysphoria. Therapy, the pattern focused therapy, consists of replacing hurtful, painful, maladaptive patterns um, with helpful, adaptive patterns. And this is done by interpreting situations and behaviors in a certain way so as to throw light, shed light suddenly on how maladaptive the pattern is. You see, there's there's a commonality between all these. They, they, all, the, all these therapies assume that early on in childhood, we had become malformed. And this malformation, this wrong molding, wrong sculpting of who we are, I mean, there, there is a, a tendency to regard the, the newborn as a kind of raw material. And the parents mold and sculpt this raw material kind of plastic art of parenting. And they produce an objet d'art. They produce an art, um, artwork. But if they don't know how to do it, or if they have their own problems, the dead mother, Andre Green's dead mother, then the objet d'art is deformed, malformed, and is likely to behave in ways which will not be conducive to health, happiness, um, rela good rela satisfactory relationships, attainment of goals, etc., etc. They all make these assumptions. This is the underlying assumption of modern psychotherapies, in plural. Which leads me to schema therapy. Schema therapy was developed by Young. Schema therapy changes these maladaptive patterns, which in schema therapy, they're called schemas. There are 18 schemas. These are enduring and self-defeating ways of regarding oneself and others. And the 18 schemas are arranged in five domains. Schemas are, are perpetuated through, through coping styles. There is schema maintenance, schema, schema avoidance, and schema compensation. And you can, you can work with these schemas. You can reconstruct them, which is very difficult. It takes a lot of time and investment. But you can also modify them, which is a bit easier. You can interpret them. Insight is supposed to generate internal dynamics of change. Or you can camouflage them, disguise them, so that they are no longer able to operate. Very similar, by the way, to how viruses behave with the immune system. Just an apropos. I'm going to read to you a list of all the schemas, because it's a wonderful summary or summation of everything that's wrong with cluster B personality disorders. So here are the schemas maladaptive schemas and schema domains. Schema domain number one, disconnection and rejection. One, abandonment, instability, the belief that significant others will not or cannot provide reliable and stable support. Number two, mistrust, abuse, the belief that others will abuse, humiliate, cheat, lie, manipulate, or take advantage of you. Number three, emotional deprivation, the belief that one's desire for emotional support will not be met by others. Number Next one, defectiveness, shame. The belief that one is defective, bad, unwanted, 
or inferior in important aspects. Social isolation, alienation, the belief that one is alienated, different from others, or not part of any group. Impaired autonomy and performance is the next domain. And within this domain, we have the following schema. Dependence in competence, the belief that one is unable to competently meet everyday responsibilities without considerable help from others. Vulnerability to harm or illness, the exaggerated fear that imminent catastrophe will strike at any time and that one will be un unable to prevent it, catastrophizing. Next schema, next scheme, enmeshment, undeveloped self, the belief that one must be emotionally close with others at the expense of full individuation or normal social development. Next scheme, failure, the belief that one will inevitably fail or is fundamentally inadequate in achieving one's goals. Next domain, impaired limits or boundaries. Scheme number one, entitlement, grandiosity, the belief that one is superior to others and not bound by the rules and norms that govern normal social interaction. Number two, insufficient self-control, self-discipline, the belief that one is incapable of self-control and frustration, tolerance. Next domain, other directness at other people. Subjugation, the belief that one's desires, needs and feelings must be suppressed in order to meet the needs of others and avoid retaliation or criticism. Next, self-sacrifice, the belief that one must meet the needs of others at the expense of one's own gratification. Next, approval seeking, recognition seeking, the belief that one must constantly seek to belong and be accepted at the expense of developing a true sense of self. And then we have the domain of overvigilance or hypervigilance and inhibition. Scheme number one, negativity, pessimism, a pervasive lifelong focus on the negative aspects of life while minimizing the positive and optimistic aspects. Next, emotional inhibition, the excessive inhibition of spontaneous action, feeling or communication, usually in order to avoid disapproval by others feelings of shame or losing control of one's impulses. Next, unrelenting standards, hypercriticalness, the belief that striving to meet unrealistically high standards of performance is essential in order to be accepted and to avoid criticism. And finally, punitiveness, the belief that others should be harshly punished for making errors. Schema therapy is a very powerful therapy and very intelligent, if I may add. Next, Kernberg, who else? Still active in his 80s, amazing man. The father of the field, together a bit later with Theodore Miller. Transference focused psychotherapy, developed by Kernberg. Kernberg said that infants form internal representations of self and internal representations of others, of objects. And the infant connects these internal representations of self and others via emotions, or more precisely, affect. A personality disorder occurs when positive representations and negative representations fail to integrate later in life. Echoes of Melanie Klein. Such splitting, such splitting between all negative, all positive, representations of self and of others, such splitting affects, of course, relationships, including the therapeutic relationship, including therapy. So Kernberg, very similar to cold therapy, I'm doing this in cold therapy as well, Kernberg encourages trans transference to the therapist because he believed that when the patient engages in transference, when the patient projects his innards, so to speak, his internal objects onto the therapist. The patient exposes these internal objects to scrutiny. The patient delineates the faulty relationship template by engaging in a faulty relationship with the therapist via transference. And if the therapist is empathic, the therapist can correct this faulty template via empathy and support and so insight, empathy and insight, these are the two pillars.
So identity integration is accomplished as the patient experiences negative emotions, but in a safe, accepting environment. Beautiful. If you, if you are an adherent of object relations, as I am, this is simply beautiful. It's the culmination of the field. Okay, next one. Mentalization-based treatment, MBT. Remember, all these therapies have been um, have been um, deemed have, have been deemed as efficient or efficacious therapies. There is some something called Division 12 of the American Psychological Association, and they measure the efficiency of therapies. So all these got top marks. It's like these companies that measure the efficacy of anti antivirus programs, you know. So this one passed. They, they fought well the malware of the mind. Mentalization-based treatment and MBT developed by Bateman and Fonagi. This therapy, this treatment mode or modality assumes that, um, that you need to, as a therapist, you need to help the patient to experience secure attachment. Because if the patient experiences secure attachment, he can, he can develop impulse control. They believe that impulse control is the outcome of insecure attachment. So they empathically and insightfully, they provide insights, reflect on and label correctly the patient's state of mind. They believe that by analyzing this state of mind and giving it a label, this helps the patient to feel safe and secure as though the patient has a handle on his situation and this allows him to control his impulses they believe that impulse control is possibly the biggest problem in relationships and so if the state of mind is insightfully reflected on and correctly labeled especially powerful emotions uh, especially cognitive errors if they're pointed out it's 50 percent to healing and this leads to improved relational skills. Finally, developmental therapy. Developmental therapy was developed by quite a few people, but the main figures are Blocher, B-L-O-C-H-R, Blocher, um, Cartwright and Sperry. Cartwright, Blocher and Sperry. Developmental therapy regards problem, problems in personal growth and needs satisfaction on a dimensional continuum from disordered to adequate to optimal. So when you analyze the patient's personal growth trajectory, you know, we have this uh, phrase that we no longer use, by the way, arrested development. It's taboo. Don't use it. It's like the N word. So when you analyze personal growth, when you analyze the satisfaction of the patient's basic and not so basic needs, you know, Maslow hierarchy, when you analyze this, you shouldn't analyze them discreetly, but you should create a continuum, a spectrum, a dimension. And this dimension goes from disordered to adequate to optimal. And I'm going to read to you, quoting from Len Sperry's book, aforementioned, I'm going to read to you how this looks with cluster B, select cluster B disorders, mainly the dramatic ones. Histrionic, optimal. So everyone has a spectrum. Every cluster B disorder has a spectrum. Every healthy person has a spectrum. And the spectrum is optimal, adequate, and disordered. So histrionic, optimal. Having found the love they seek within themselves, they are altruistic and giving without expecting reciprocity. That's the optimal. Adequate. While fun-loving and often impulsive, they can delay gratification and be emotionally appropriate much of the time. The disordered version, which is histrionic personality disorder, the disordered version is uncomfortable in situations in which they are not the center of attention. By the way, the dis uh, histrionic personality disorder, together with schizoid personality disorder and others, had been removed from the alternative model of the DSM-5, and they will not exist in the DSM-6. Let's talk about narcissistic. What's the optimal, adequate and disordered versions of narcissism? Narcissistic, optimal, 
energetic, self-assured, without expecting special treatment or privileged, or privilege, adequate, confident yet emotionally vulnerable. They favor special treatment or privilege. Disordered narcissistic personality disorder manifests a grandiose sense of self-importance and demands special privilege. Schizoid, it's cluster A, it's, it's not cluster B. Schizoid, optimal, deeply grounded in themselves. They are emotionally connected to the world. That's optimal. Adequate, reasonably comfortable being around others, provided there are limited demands for intimacy or emotional connectedness. Disordered version, neither desire nor enjoy close relationships. Now, the reason I, I inserted schizoid into this is because I recommend that you watch three of my previous videos, the series about schizoid narcissists. The good grounds assume that schizoid personality disorder is a facet of narcissism, is another name for a subtype of narcissist. Dependent, codependent. Optimal, may seek out the opinions and advice of others when making major decisions, but the decisions they make are ultimately their own. Optimal. Adequate. Have the capacity to be responsible and make decisions, but still seek out and rely on others for help and advice. Disordered. Codependent or dependent personality disorder. Needs others to assume responsibility for most major areas of their lives. Antisocial or psychopath. Psychopath is an extreme antisocial. Optimal. Have the gift of gab and easily befriend others, although they may not offer much depth to these relationships. Adequate. Earn respect by acting honorably and with compassion, by using power constructively and by promoting worthwhile causes. Remember, in previous videos, I kept telling you that many, many activists, social justice activists and so on, are actually psychopaths. But they are adequate psychopaths. Disordered. A real psychopath, uh, a Robert Hare, Harvey Cleckley psychopath, primary psychopath, exhibits aggressive, impulsive, self-serving, self-serving and irresponsible behavior. Okay, borderline, the queen of the of the of the roost, borderline, optimal, sensitive, introspective, and impressionable individuals who are very comfortable with their feelings and inner impulses. Adequate borderline. They quickly and easily engage in relationships and are sometimes hurt and rejected in the process. Disordered borderline displays frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined rejection and abandonment. And finally, I think, yeah, finally, the paranoid. Optimal, highly observant and discerning. They can defend themselves without losing control or becoming aggressive. Adequate, thin-skinned, they are rather sensitive to and hurt by criticism, which is very similar to narcissists. One of the reasons I, I keep saying that paranoia or paranoid personality disorder is a subtype of narcissistic personality disorder. Paranoia is narcissism. Disordered, suspicious, without sufficient basis, that others are exploiting, harming or deceiving them. Okay, and now we come to the last one, number 12, called therapy developed by Vaknin. Core therapy is based on two premises. One, that narcissistic disorders are actually forms of complex post-traumatic conditions. And two, that narcissists are the outcomes of arrested development. You don't, you don't say here. Yeah. Narcissists are actually the outcomes of arrested development and attachment dysfunctions. Consequently, core therapy borrows techniques from child psychology because narcissists are children. Narcissists, according to core therapy, are children in a post-traumatic state. So, cold therapy borrows techniques from child psychology and from treatment modalities used to, in order to deal with PTSD and CPTSD. Cold therapy consists of the re-traumatization of the narcissistic client in a hostile, non-holding environment, which resembles the ambience of the original trauma, recreates the original trauma. The adult patient successfully successfully tackles this second round of hurt and so resolves early childhood conflicts and achieves closure, 
rendering his now maladaptive narcissistic defenses unnecessary, redundant, and obsolete. This also improves his relational capacity because the narcissist goes through the, the trauma a second time, but this time resolves the conflict, the early childhood conflict. So he doesn't need to do this with his spouse or his next girlfriend or his intimate partner or lover. Call therapy makes use of proprietary techniques such as erasure, suppressing the client's speech and free expression and gaining clinical information and insights from his reactions to being stifled this way. Other techniques include grandiosity, reframing, guided imagery, negative iteration, other scoring, happiness map, mirroring, escalation, role play, assimilative confabulation, hypervigilant referencing, and reparenting. Uh, the very limited sample of uh, clients who had undergone cold therapy to its end, level one, two, and three, um, the results have been uh, very positive. It proves it's proving to be an efficacious, treat, effective treatment for narcissistic personality disorder and major depressive episode, which seems to sustain an early belief that narcissism is a form of depression. Cold therapy is also philosophical, really metaphysical framework. I suggest that the client should regard his or her life as a movie. The main goal in life, the core task and the engine of meaning is to direct this movie, to direct this film, so as to render it an accomplished hit, a work of art and a masterpiece of narrative. At every inflection point and faced with any critical decision, the client should truthfully answer the question. Would I have paid money to watch this movie? This yarn that I'm weaving, the flick that is my life. If the answer is no, a transformative change, of course, is called for. Directing the film should be the client's overriding priority. Every other thing should be subservient and secondary to this role, to this chore. Everyone in the client's life should feature in this movie. And yet the client should navigate this light motif and channel his or her creativity without a script, as an exercise in extemporizing, improvising. The twists and turns of the plot should come as a surprise, first and foremost, to the client himself. Okay, now let's to some criticism of some of these treatment modalities. Start with mindfulness. I said that mindfulness has been, had been incorporated to various therapies. Modern treatment modalities, ther psychotherapies, emphasize the present over the past and the future. Mindfulness. There is a clinical diagnosis for the kind of people who are focused on the moment, care little about the past and others in the past, and cannot foresee or take into reckoning the consequences of their actions in the future. These kind of people are called psychopaths. Mindfulness, in my view, and that's only my view, fosters entitlement, grandiosity, disempathy, recklessness. I am dead set against it. It's also too closely allied with new age, fake gurus, con artists. You know, I don't like it. I seriously dislike it. Next, cognitive behavioral behavioral therapies, CBT. The CBT is this group of therapies, this family of therapies, postulate that insight, even if merely verbal insight, intellectual, analytical insight, is sufficient to induce an emotional outcome. Verbal cues, analysis of mantras, of negative automatic thoughts that we keep repeating. For example, I'm ugly. I'm afraid no one would like to be with me. I'm bound to fail. If you analyze these sentences, the itemizing of our inner dialogue or monologue, our inner narrative, and our repeated behavior patterns, learned behaviors and learned helplessness, when, when they're coupled with positive and rarely negative reinforcements. So if you put all this together, the inventory list of your thoughts, your behaviors, your, your beliefs about yourself, and the therapist then uses negative and positive reinforcements, if you put all this together, this induces, according to CBT, cumulative emotional effect, emotional, tantamount to healing. 
Here's the problem. Cognitive reframing is not a technique in any treatment modality. It refers to a mental process of shifting thinking. The inner conversion of positive thoughts regarding oneself, one's life and others into negative cognitions or vice versa. Cognitive reframing can be induced in therapy or by shifting circumstances of one's life, as well as by new information. Reframing is a shift from one narrative of one's life and of others' place and roles in one's life to another narrative with a bigger explanatory power, an organizing principle which imbues one's personal history with meaning and direction creates goal orientation, goal direction. So the technique used in various psychotherapies is known as cognitive restructuring of cognitive distortions. Cognitive distortions is, is automatic negative thoughts or ands. Yeah? But they are distortions. They are not real. They are counterfactual. They conflict head on with reality. But when these negative automatic cognitions, con thoughts, conflict with reality, the patient gives up on reality. He is invested emotionally in the validity and truth of these negative automatic thoughts. So he is fighting tooth and nail to preserve them. Cognitive restructuring is the main technique used in CBT. Some elements of cognitive restructuring, like guided imagery, are incorporated in cold therapy as well. Psychodynamic theories reject the... So, this is CBT. Psychodynamic theories reject the notion that cognition can influence emotion. That's where there's a major conflict between the metaphysical, if you wish, pillar or philosophical pillar of CBT and psychodynamic theories. The psychodynamic theory says your thinking cannot influence your emotions. Healing requires access access to and the study of much deeper strata by both patient and therapist. It's not enough just to think. You need to dig deep. Psychodynamic therapies, starting with psychoanalysis, they are a form of archaeology. Let's, let's say that CBT is tourism and psychodynamic therapies are archaeology. The very exposure of these deep layers to the therapeutic process is considered sufficient to induce a dynamic of healing. The therapist's role is either to interpret the material revealed to the patient, for example, in psychoanalysis, by allowing the patient to transfer past experience and superimpose it on the therapist. Another option is to provide a safe emotional and holding environment conducive to the patient changing himself. So either the, the therapist is active, has an active role, or he just provides the environment within which he activates the patient, and then it's the patient who is doing the work. The sad fact is that no known therapy is effective with narcissism itself. There are quite a few therapies, treatment modalities, which are reasonably successful as far as coping with some of the effects of narcissism, some of the abrasive and antisocial and self-defeating behaviors. So, many therapies are very effective at modifying the behaviors of the narcissist, but none of them, not even cold therapy, heals or cures narcissism. The nonsensical, nonsensical uh, concept of recovered narcissism or recovered narcissists, it's a scam. I'm sorry, anyone who uses this phrase is a con artist pretending to be a professional. No textbook supports this. Um, let's talk a bit about dynamic psychotherapy, psychodynamic therapy, and psychoanalytic psychotherapy, the old school. All of them are not psychoanalysis, just to be clear. Um, all of them are, it's, they are forms of intensive psychotherapy based on psychoanalytic theor theory without the very important element of free association. This is not to say that free association is not used in these therapies, only that it is not a pillar of the technique. You can go through a course of therapy in these therapies and not freely associate. Dynamic therapies are usually applied to patients not considered suitable for psychoanalysis, 
for example, those suffering from personality disorders, with one exception, the avoid, uh, avoidant personalities. Typically, different modes of interpretation are employed and other techniques borrowed from other treatment modalities. It's very eclectic, actually. But the material interpreted is not necessarily the result of free association or dreams, like in psychoanalysis. The psychotherapist is a lot more active than the psychoanalyst. The psychoanalyst provi provides a blank screen on which the patient projects everything via transference, via defense mechanisms and so on. The uh, psychotherapist in dynamic psychotherapy, psychodynamic therapy and psychoanalytic psychotherapy is very active, is an active interpreter. It's a collaboration. Psychodynamic therapies are also open-ended. At the commencement of a therapy, the therapist, analyst, makes an agreement, a pact, alliance, therapeutic alliance, with the analysis, with the patient or the client. The pact says that the patient undertakes to explore his problems for as long as may be needed, which is, of course, very good for the therapist's bank account. This is supposed to make the therapeutic environment much more relaxed because the patient knows that the analyst is at his or her disposal no matter how many minutes would, uh, meetings would be required in order to broach painful subject matter. In other words, there's a blank check. The therapist is telling the, the patient, no, no matter how long this is going to be, even if it's years, I'm going to be here for you at your disposal for as long as you want me. So we call this open-ended psychotherapy. And sometimes these therapies are divided to expressive versus supportive, but it's a bit of a misleading. Uh, in my view, it's a bit of a misleading division. Still, expressive means uncovering, making conscious the patient's conflicts and studying his or her defenses and resistances. The analyst interprets the conflict in view of the new knowledge gained and guides the therapy towards a resolution of the conflict. The conflict, in other words, is interpreted away through insight and through the change in the patient motivated by his or her insights. So insights come from both the therapist and the patient. The supportive therapies, as opposed to the exposure, uh, the expressive therapies, I'm sorry. The supportive therapies seek to strengthen the ego. Their premise is that a strong ego can cope better and later on alone with external situational or internal, instinctual, related to drives, pressures. Remember, the narcissist does not have an ego. That's a narcissist problem, ironically. Supportive therapies seek to increase the patient's ability to repress conflicts rather than bring them to the surface of consciousness. When the patient's painful conflicts are suppressed or repressed, the attendant dysphorias the symptoms the conflict had generated vanish and are ameliorated or reduced. So does the anxiety. This is somewhat reminiscent of behaviorism. The main aim is to change behavior and to relieve symptoms, never mind what. And it usually makes no use. The, the, this kind of behavior of the therapies make no use of insight or interpretation, although there are some exceptions. Let's talk a bit, a bit about group therapies, cluster B, cluster B patients in group therapies. Start with narcissists. Narcissists are notoriously unsuitable for collaborative efforts of any kind. They're not team players and they're not built for group therapy. They immediately size up other people as potential sources of narcissistic supply. They use cold empathy the, or they decide that someone is a potential competitor. It's a power play immediately. They idealize the suppliers and devalue the competitors. This obviously is not very conducive to the dynamic in the group. Moreover, the dynamic of the group is bound to reflect the interactions of its members. Narcissists are individualistic, borderlines are anxious, psychopaths are ruthless and callous. And so cluster B personality disordered people regard coalitions with disdain or contempt or as opportunities or, you know, it's not good. The need to resort to teamwork to adhere to group rules, to succumb to a moderator and an agenda, and to honor and respect the other members as equals, is perceived by cluster B patients as either humiliating and degrading, or as contemptible weakness, 
or is something to be exploited and leveraged. And so a group containing one or more cluster B patients is likely to deteriorate very fast, degenerate and fluctuate between short-term, very small size coalitions based on superiority, interest, content, and outbreaks, especially narcissistic outbreaks, acting out the compensation of rage, coercion, uh, anxiety. The most difficult patients by far in therapy are psychopaths and narcissists. In therapy, the general idea is to create the conditions for the true self to resume its growth, provide safety, predictability, justice, love, acceptance, a mirroring, reparenting, a holding environment. Therapy is supposed to provide these conditions of nurturance and guidance through transference, transference, cognitive relabeling or other methods. And the narcissist must learn that his past experiences are not laws of nature, that not all adults are abusive, that relationships can be nurturing and supportive, that love is fun. Most therapists try to co-opt the narcissist's inflated ego, his false self, his defenses. They compliment the narcissist, challenging him to prove his omnipotence by overcoming his own disorder. They appeal to the narcissist's quest for perfection, brilliance and eternal love, and to the narcissist's paranoid tendencies in an attempt to get rid of counterproductive, self-defeating and dysfunctional behavior patterns. And by stroking the narcissist's grandiosity, these therapists hope to modify or to counter cognitive deficits, thinking errors, the narcissist's victim starts, bad dynamics, the, these therapists make a contract with the narcissist, they contract with the narcissist, in order to alter his conduct. And some therapists even go to the extent of medicalizing the disorder, attributing, attributing it to a genetic, hereditary or biochemical origin, and so absolving the narcissist from his responsibility and freeing, freeing his mental resources to concentrate, to focus on the therapy. Confronting the narcissist head-on and engaging in power politics, I'm more clever than you, my will will prevail, and so on, is decidedly unhelpful and could lead to rage attacks and a deepening of the narcissist's persecutory delusions bred by his humiliation in the therapeutic setting. Same goes for borderlines, same for, same for psychopaths. Successes have been reported by applying 12-step techniques as modified for patients suffering from antisocial personality disorder. And also with some treatment modalities, even NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which many say is a scam, seem to somehow work. Schema therapy that I've mentioned, eye movement desensitization, EMDR, and so on. But whatever the type of talk therapy, the narcissist devalues the therapist. The narcissist's internal dialogue is, I know best, I know everything. This therapist is less intelligent than I am. I can't afford the top-level therapist who is the only one qualified to treat me, as my equal, of course. I'm actually a therapist myself. Why am I, why am I here? What am I doing here? And so there's a litany of self-delusion, grandiose self-delusion, and fantastic grandiosity. These are defenses, of course, resistances, because um, the, in the therapy, there's a kind of role play I mentioned at the beginning of this video, long, long time ago, when we were all much younger, that the narcissist approaches therapy as he approaches a shared fantasy, and he allocates roles. Now, the problem with therapy is that at the very inception of the therapy, there are roles allocated. Superior authority therapist type, inferior supplicant narcissist type. No, no, narcissists don't like this. And so they react with defense and resistance, and they say, a narcissist says to himself, he, my therapist, should be my colleague. It, we are equal. In certain respect, it is he who should accept my professional authority and learn from me. Why won't he be my friend? After all, I can use the lingo and the psychobabble even better than he does. I know terminology and I know his own field better than him. At any rate, it's us, me and him, against a hostile and ignorant world. Shared psychosis, folie à deux. And then there is this internal dialogue. Just who does the therapist think he is? 
asking me all these questions. What are his professional credentials, I wonder? Which university did he graduate, if at all? I am a success and he is a nobody therapist in a dingy office. And he is trying to negate my uniqueness. I am making 10 times more money than he does. He is an authority figure in his own office. And I hate this and I hate him. And I will show him. I will humiliate him. I will prove him ignorant. I will have his license revoked. Transference. Actually, this therapist is pitiable. He's a zero. He's a failure. And I will smear him everywhere I go after all this is over. Such reactions are uh, even much more common among borderlines and psychopaths. And this is only in the first three sessions of the therapy. And this abusive internal exchange becomes more vituperative and pe pejorative as therapy progresses. Agnes Oppenheim wrote the following in the International Dictionary of Psychoanalysis. Mirror, mirror transference is the remobilization of the grandiose self. Its expression is, I am perfect, and I need you in order to confirm to me that I'm perfect. When it is very archaic, mirror transference can easily result in feelings of boredom, tension, and impatience in the analyst, whose otherness is not recognized in the analyst, in the therapist. Counter-transference is a sign of this. The notion which first appeared in Heinz Kohut's work in the Psychoanalytic Treatment of Narcissistic Personality Disorders in 1968, this notion of mirror transference was further elaborated in Kohut's analysis of the self in 1971. Mirror transference can take three forms depending on the degree of regression and the nature of the point of fixation. Fusion transference is the most archaic form and it refers to a primary identity relationship in which the other, the therapist, is completely a part of the self, an extension. It shows itself when the analyst is taken to be omnipotent and tyrannical and is experienced as an extension of the self. In twinship or other or alter ego transference, the other, the therapist, is experienced as being like the self. Lastly, in mirror transference, properly speaking, the analyst is experienced, the therapist is experienced as a function in, at the service of the patient's needs. If the patient feels recognized, he experiences a sense of well-being linked to the restoration of his narcissism. Mirror transference can be primary, the reaction to a broken idealizing transference, or secondary to one of these. In The Restoration of the Self, a book published in 1977, Heinz Kohut distinguished it from alter ego transference. Some authors have refused to consider this transference as being a result of the evolution of narcissism. They have seen it merely as a defense. Narcissists generally are averse to being medicated. Actually, most patients with personality disorders are averse to medication. Resorting to medicines is an implied admission that something is wrong. Narcissists are control freaks, and they hate to be under the influence of mind-altering drugs prescribed to them by inferior others. Additionally, many of them believe that medication is a great equalizer. It will make them lose their uniqueness, creativity, superiority, and so on. It's a form of social control. Unless they can convincingly present the act of taking their medicines as heroism, they don't, don't want to take medicine. Sometimes, with, for example, pioneering vaccines, the, the narcissist can tell himself what, that what he's doing is heroic. It's a daring enterprise of self-exploration, uh, which is intended to benefit humanity. It's part of a breakthrough clinical trial, and so on and so forth. But these are exceptions. Narcissists and personality disordered people often claim that the medicine affects them differently than it does other people, or that they have discovered a new exciting way of using the medicine, or that they are part of someone's, usually themselves, learning curve, part of a new approach to dosage, part of a new cocktail which holds great promise. Narcissists, borderlines, histrionics, they must dramatize their lives in order to feel worthy and special. Out nihil, out unique.
either be special or don't be at all. Narcissists are drama queens, exactly like borderlines and histrionics, and subtypes of psychopaths. Very much like in the physical world, change is brought about only through incredible powers of torsion and breakage. Only when the narcissist elast elasticity gives way, only when he is wounded by his own intransigence, only then is there hope. It takes nothing less than hitting rock bottom, real hard, it takes a real crisis, multifaceted, in all dimensions of the narcissist's life, simultaneously. And we, boredom, failure, are not enough. Esteemed colleagues, uh, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Sam Bakhnin, and I'm visiting professor of psychology in Southern Federal University in Rostov on Don in the Russian Federation, as well as a professor of finance and a professor of psychology in CIAPS, CIAPS, the Center for International Advanced and Professional Studies. Today I would like to discuss um, the issue of codependency. Now, as we all know, codependency is not an official mental health diagnosis, at least not within the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in its latest iteration, which is the fifth edition of 2013. Instead, there is something called dependent personality disorder, and there has been in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for almost for well over 20 years. So this creates a great confusion regarding the terms codependent, counterdependent, dependent, etc., etc. So perhaps before we proceed to study the, uh, to study dependent personality disorder, um, we would do well to try to clarify uh, these terms. As Lydia Rangelovska observes, we all need to be needed. We all want to feel useful and able to give. People resent the narcissist partly because his false self, the facade he puts out to the world, is so self-sufficient. But codependents take this to a whole different level, to a new extreme. Like dependents, people with dependent personality disorder, Codependents depend on other people for their emotional gratification, the regulation of their emotions and moods, reducing lability, and the performance of both inconsequential and crucial daily psychological, or in uh, Freudian parlance, ego functions. Codependents seek to fuse or to merge with their significant others by becoming one with their intimate partners Codependents are able to actually love themselves by loving others. It is like loving yourself by proxy, vicariously. Codependents are needy, demanding, clinging, and submissive. They suffer from abandonment anxiety, and to avoid being overwhelmed by it, they cling to others and act immaturely. And in this sense, they are very reminiscent of some aspects of borderline personality disorder and some aspect, aspects of the complex post-traumatic stress disorder uh, syndrome. These behaviors are intended to elicit protective responses and to safeguard the relationship with their companion or mate upon whom they depend. Codependents appear to be impervious to abuse. No matter how badly they are mistreated, they usually remain committed to the relationship. In extreme codependence, this fusion, this merger with the significant other lead to in-house stalking as the codependent strives to preserve the integrity and the cohesion of her personality and the representations of her loved ones within her mind. So what I call in-house stalking is actually stalking perpetrated by the codependent on her intimate partner. This is where the co in codependence comes into play. By accepting the role of victims, Codependents seek to control their abusers and to manipulate them. It is a dance macabre in which both members of the dial collaborate. It's a kind of traumatic bonding or trauma bonding. In codependency, the codependent sometimes claims to pity her abuser. She casts herself in the grandiose roles of his savior or his redeemer or his mother. Her overwhelming empathy imprisons the codependent in these dysfunctional relationships 
and she feels guilt, either because she believes that she had driven the abuser to mistreat her, or because she contemplates more and more seriously to abandon him. There are various types of codependence. Codependency is a complex, multifaceted, and multidimensional defense against the codependent's fears and needs. So I distinguish between four categories of codependency stemming from their respective etiologies, or psychodynamic um, processes and psychological etiology. So the first category is codependency that aims to fend off anxieties related to abandonment. These codependents are clingy, smothering, and prone to panic. They are plagued with ideas of reference, referential ideation, and they display self-negating submissiveness. Their main concern is to prevent their victims, friends, spouses, family members, from abandoning and deserting them, or from attaining true autonomy and independence. These codependents merge with their loved ones and experience any sign of abandonment or autonomy, personal autonomy, whether real, actual, threatened, imagined, they experience these as form, a form of self-annihilation or even amputation. They do not allow their partners to kind of separate an individual. The second category of codependency is codependency that is geared to cope with the codependent's fear of losing control. By feigning helplessness and neediness, such codependents coerce their environment into ceaselessly and seamlessly catering to their needs, wishes, and requirements. These codependents are drama queens. And their life is a kaleidoscope of instability, chaos, and lability. They refuse to grow up. They force their nearest and dearest to treat them as emotional or physical invalids. They deploy their self-imputed deficiencies and disabilities. They yield them and wield them as weapons. Both types of, uh, both these types of codependence, type one and type two, use emotional blackmail and when necessary, guilt trip and when necessary, threats to secure the presence and blind compliance, blind compliance of their suppliers. Anything less triggers anxiety. The third category um, are vicarious codependents. These are codependents who live through others. More, like, like the, more, more or less like the moon's reflected sunlight. They sacrifice themselves in order to glory in the accomplishments of their chosen targets. They subsist on reflected light, as I said, on second-hand applause, and on derivative achievements and accomplishments. They have no personal history, having suspended their lives, their wishes, preferences, and dreams in favor of another's. They live by proxy. They live vicariously. They live through another, a parasitic existence. One subtype of such codependence is what I call inverted narcissist. The inverted narcissist um, is a form of covert narcissist. Uh, it is a codependent who depends exclusively on narcissist, a narcissist codependent. If you are living with a narcissist, if you have a relationship with a narcissist, if you are married to one, if you are working with a narcissist, etc., this does not mean that you are an inverted narcissist. To qualify, so to speak, as an inverted narcissist, you must crave to be in a relationship with a narcissist, regardless of any abuse inflicted on you by him. You must actively seek relationships with narcissists and only with narcissists, no matter what your bitter and traumatic past experience has been. You must feel empty and unhappy in relationships with any other type of person. Only then, and if you satisfy the other diagnostic criteria of dependent personality disorder, only then can you be safely labeled an inverted narcissist. So this is an example of a vicarious codependent, the category three. And category four is codependent or borderline narcissist. These are narcissists who oscillate between periods of clinging and other codependent behavior patterns, which they interpret as intimacy, and eras of aloofness, detachment, and emotional neglect and abandonment, which they regard as legitimate and only possible manifestations of their personal autonomy and need for space. They also tend to form with their intimate partner a shared psychosis or a shared psychotic disorder, the affolia deux. These are all outcomes of their overwhelming and all pervasive abandonment anxiety. They either smother their partner in an attempt to forestall desertion, or they preemptively, preemptively abandon sheep 
thus avoiding hurt and maintaining an illusion of control over the situation. They say, I walked out on her, I dumped her, not the other way around. The codependent deploys strategies such as merger, becoming one with her intimate partner, while renouncing all personal autonomy and all independence of both of them, up to a point of shared circumstances. Another strategy is coextensivity, the ventriloquist defense, insisting that the partner mind reads her and acts in ways that reflect her inner psychological states and moods. And then there's the classic strategy of shifting, ever shifting, or shape shifting boundaries using behavioral unpredictability and ambient uncertainty to induce paralysis uh, and a paralyzing dependence in the partner. There's another form of uh, codependence um, that is so subtle that it eluded detection until very recently, and that's counterdependence. Counterdependents reject and despise authority and often clash with authority fig figures, such as parents, bosses, the law. They are consummations. The sense of self-worth and their very self-identity are premised on and derived from, in other words, dependent on, these acts of bravura and defiance. They are personal autonomy militants. Counterdependents are fiercely militantly independent, controlling, self-centered, and aggressive. Many of them are antisocial, and they use projective identification. They force people to behave in ways that buttress and affirm their view of the world and its expectations. These behavior patterns are often the result of a deep-seated fear of intimacy. In an intimate relationship, the counterdependent feels enslaved, ensnared, captive. Counterdependents are locked into an approach avoidance, repulsion, uh, 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 repetition, compulsion. They, the hesitant approach is followed by Avoidance of commitment, and then another uh, titled, stilted approach, and so on. These people are lone wolves, and they're very bad team players. Counterdependence is a reaction formation. The counterdependent dreads his own weakness. He seeks to overcome these weaknesses by projecting an image of omnipotence, omniscience, success, self sufficiency, and superiority. Most classical overt narcissists are, in effect, counterdependents, and of course, all psychopaths. Their emotions and needs are buried under scar tissue, which had formed and coalesced and hardened during the years of one form of abuse or another. Grandiosity, a sense of entitlement, lack of empathy, and overwhelming haughtiness, overwhelming haughtiness, usually hide knowing insecurity and a fluctuating sense of self worth. And then there's situational codependence. Some patients develop codependent behaviors and traits in the wake of a life crisis, especially if this crisis involves an abandonment and resulting solitude. So in the wake of a divorce or an empty nest, when was one's children embark on their own autonomous lives or leave home altogether. Such late onset codependence fosters a complex emotional and behavioral chain reaction, whose role is to resolve the inner conflict by ridding oneself of the emergent, undesirable, codependent conduct. Consciously, such a patient may, at first, feel liberated, but unconsciously, being abruptly dumped and lonesome, has a disorienting and disconcerting effect, akin to intoxication. Many patients rush headlong and indiscriminately into new relationships. Deep inside, this kind of patient has always, had, has always dreaded being lonely, Lonely, not alone. Following a divorce, the death of a significant other or an intimate partner, the passing away of parents or other loved ones, children relocating to college, following similar episodes of dislocation, she, the patient suppresses this dread because she possesses no real effective solutions and antidotes to her sudden solitude. And she has developed no meaningful uh, ways to cope with it. We are taught that denied and repressed emotions often re-emerge in camouflage, as it were. The dread of ending up all alone is such that the patient becomes codependent in order to make sure that she never finds herself in, uh, a, sim in a situation like this. Never finds herself alone. Her codependency is a series of dysfunctional behaviors that are intended to fend off abandonment and loneliness. And still, 
Patients who develop situational codependence, unlike classic lifelong codependence, uh, are fundamentally balanced and strong personalities who cherish their self-control. So they always keep all their options open, including the vital option of going alone yet again. They um, make sure to choose the wrong partner and then they spectacularly expose his egregious misconduct so that they can get rid of him and of the newly acquired codependency in good conscience and at the same time. So to reiterate, the situational codependent is characterized by a deep-set fear of being lonely, an abandonment anxiety, a form of attachment disorder, as an underlying dormant inner landscape. This lurking abandonment anxiety is awakened by life's tribulations, divorce and emptiness, death of one's nearest and dearest. At first, the newly found freedom is exhilarating and intoxicating, but this feel-good factor actually serves to enhance the anxiety. The inner dialogue goes something like this. What if it feels so good that I will opt, opt to remain by myself for the rest of my days? This prospect is terrifying. So, a conflict erupts, you know, internal conflict, between conscious emotions and behaviors, liberation, joy, pleasure-seeking, and a nagging unconscious anxiety. I'm not getting any younger. This can go on forever. I've got to settle down to find appropriate ma mate, not to be left alone. I shouldn't get addicted to being alone. To allay this internal tension, the patient comes up with situational codependency as a coping strategy to attract and bond with a mate so as to forestall abandonment. Yet the situational codependent is egotistonic. She is very unhappy with her newfound codependency, though at this stage she is utterly unaware of all these dynamics. It runs contrary, her codependency runs contrary to her primary nature as accomplished, assertive, self-confident person with a well-regulated sense of self-worth. She feels the need to frustrate this new set of compulsive addictions, her codependency, and to get rid of it because it threatens who she is and who she thinks she is, her identity and self-perception. Surely she is not the clinging, maudlin, weak, out-of-control type. All her life she has known herself to be strong, a good judge of character, intelligent and in control. Codependency does not become her. But how could she get rid of this new codependency? Well, in three easy steps. She chooses the wrong partner, unconsciously, and obviously it leads, again, to being alone. She proves to her satisfaction that he is the wrong partner for her. She gets rid of him, thus re-establishing her autonomy, her resilience, her self-control, and demonstrating credibly that she is codependent no more. To make matters clear, codependency is a much disputed mental health pseudo-diagnosis. We are all dependent to some degree, or we all like to be taken care of. When is this need judged to be pathological, compulsive, pervasive and excessive? And who decides? Clinicians who contributed to the study of this disorder use words such as craving, clinging, stifling, both the dependent and her partner. They use words such as humiliate, humiliating or submissive, but these are all subjective terms, either culture-bound or represent value judgments. They are open to disagreement. They are open to differences of opinion. Moreover, virtually in all cultures and societies, uh, dependency is encouraged to varying degrees, uh, especially in women. Even in developed countries, many women, the very old, the very young, the sick, the criminal, and the mentally handicapped, are denied personal autonomy. They are legally and economically dependent on others and on the authorities. Thus, dependent personality disorder is diagnosed only when such behavior does not conform to social or cultural norms or mores. Codependents, as they are sometimes known, are possessed with fantastic worries and concerns. They are paralyzed by their abandonment anxiety and fear of separation, and this inner turmoil renders them indecisive. Even the simpler everyday decision, simplest everyday decision becomes an excruciating ordeal. They go back and forth, approach avoidance. This is why codependents rarely initiate projects or do anything on their own. Codependents typically go around eliciting constant and repeated reassurances and advice from myriad sources. And this recurrent solicitation of succor is proof that the codependent seeks to transfer responsibility for his or her life to other people, whether they have agreed to assume this responsibility or not. 
It's coercive. It's blackmail. This record and studious avoidance of challenges may give the wrong impression that the dependent is indolent or insipid, yet most dependents are neither. They are often fired by repressed ambition, energy and imagination. It is the lack of self-confidence that holds them back. They don't trust their own abilities and judgment. Absent an inner compass and a realistic assessment of their positive qualities on the one hand, and a realistic assessment of their limitations on the other, or of their limitations, on the other hand, dependents are forced to rely on crucial input from the outside. Realizing this, their behavior becomes self-negating. They never disagree with meaningful others, they never criticize them. They are afraid to lose their support and emotional nurturance, but also their calibration, their place in the world. Knowing and realizing what's right and what's wrong crucially depends on input from others. They don't have self-regulation, they are dysregulated. Consequently, the codependent molds himself or herself and bends over backwards to cater to the needs of his nearest and dearest and satisfy their every, every whim, every wish, expectation and demand. Nothing is too unpleasant uh, or unacceptable if it serves to secure the uninterrupted presence of the codependent's family and friends and the emotional sustenance that she can extract from them. The codependent does not feel uh, fully alive when she is alone. She feels helpless, threatened, ill at ease and childlike. This acute discomfort drives the codependent to hop from one relationship to another and even sometimes lead to promiscuity. The sources of nurturance are interchangeable. To the codependent being with someone, with anyone, no matter who, is always preferable to solitude. Now, parents of codependents had, had taught their offspring to expect only conditional transactional love. The child is supposed to render a service or fulfill the parent's wishes and dreams in return for affection and compassion, attention and emotion, and so on. So, inevitably, the hurt child reacts with rage to this unjust, capricious, arbitrary, conditional mistreatment. Uh, mistreatment. With no recourse to the offending parent, this fury is either directed outwards to others uh, who stand in for the bad parent, or inwards. The former solution yields a psychopath or a passive aggressive, negativistic personality disorder. And the second solution, internalizing the aggression, results in a masochist or in a person with depressive illness. Similarly, with an unavailable parent, parent the child reserve of love can be directed inward at himself and yield a narcissist, or it can be directed outward, outward towards others and create a codependent. All these choices retard personal growth, result in arrested uh, development, and are ultimately self-annihilating, self-defeating at least. In all four paths, the adult plays the dual roles of a punitive parent and an eternal child who is unable and unwilling to grow up for fear of incurring the wrath and the abandonment of the parent with whom he had merged so thoroughly, so early on. When the codependent merges with the love object, she interprets her newfound attachment and bond as a betrayal of the punitive parent. She fully anticipates the internalized parent's disapproval and dreads its self-destructive disciplinary measures. In an attempt to placate this implacable divinity, she turns on her partner and lashes out at him, thus establishing where her true loyalties and affiliation rest with the internalized parent, not with the newfound love. Concurrently, she punishes herself as she tries to preempt the merciless onslaught of her sadistic parental introjects and superior ego. She engages in a panoply of self-destructive, reckless and self-defeating behaviors. Acutely aware of the risk of losing her partner owing to her abusive misconduct, the codependent experiences extreme abandonment anxiety. She swings wildly between self-effacing and clinging, being a doormat, uh, behaviors on the one hand, and explosive, vituperative invectives on the other hand, the former being a manifestation, the manifestations 
of her eternal child and, and internal child, and the latter expressions of her punitive parent. parent. Such abrupt shifts in affect and conduct are often misdiagnosed as the hallmarks of a mood disorder, maybe bipolar disorder. But where dependent personality disorder is diagnosed, these pendular tectonic upheavals are indicative of an underlying personality structure, rather than of any biochemically induced uh, perturbations. Akin to, akin to addiction, dependence on other people fulfills important mental health functions. First, it is an organizing principle. It serves to explain behaviors and events within a coherent narrative, a fictional story, a frame of reference. I acted this way because I'm dependent. Second, it gives meaning to life. Third, the constant ups and downs satisfy the need for excitement and thrills. Fourth, and most crucially, the addiction and emotional ability place the, the dependent at the center of attention, allows her to manipulate people around her to do her bidding. Indeed, codependent is convinced that she cannot live without her dependence. This is a subtle and important distinction. She, cannot, she can survive without him or her, without her intimate partner, but she believes profoundly, erroneously as it happens, that she cannot go on living without her addiction to her partner. She is in love with love, not with the partner. She experiences her dependence as her best friend, her comfort zone, as familiar and warm and fitting as an old pair of slippers. She is addicted to and dependent on her dependence, but she attributes its the source of this dependence to her boyfriend, to her mate, spouse, children, parents, anyone who happens to, to fit the bill in the plot of her narrative. But these people come and go. Her addictions remain intact. They are interchangeable. Her addiction is immutable. So extreme cases of codependency, dependent personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, they require professional help. Luckily, dependency is, dependency is a spectrum, and most people with dependent traits and behaviors are clustered somewhere in the middle. They can help themselves by realizing that the world never comes to an end when a relationship does. Um, it is the dependence in you, in the patient, that reacts with desperation, not the patient herself. And next, she, the patient can analyze her addiction. What are the stories and narratives that underlie the addiction? Uh, does she tend to idealize her intimate partner? And if so, can she see him or her in a more realistic light? Is she anxious about being abandoned? Why? Has she been traumatically abandoned in the past as a child, perhaps? She should write down the worst possible scenario. The relationship is over. She is abandoned. Uh, is her physical survival at stake? Or, of course it's not. She should make a list of the consequences of the breakup and write next to each one what she can do and intends to do about, about it. And so, armed with this plan of action, she is bound to feel safer and more confident. And she must share her thoughts, fears, and emotions with friends and family. Social support is indispensable. One good friend is sometimes worth a hundred therapy sessions. And this is a secret that we should keep between us, or we will all go on a Clinging and smothering behaviors are the unsavory consequences of a deep-set existential, almost mortal fear of abandonment and separation. For the codependent to maintain a long-term, healthy relationship, she must first confront her anxieties head-on. This can be done via psychotherapy. The therapeutic alliance is a contract between patient and therapist, which provides for a safe environment where abandonment is not an option, and thus where the client can resume exploring and personal growth and form a modicum of self-autonomy. The is, a psychiatrist may wish to prescribe anti-anxiety medication. Transference should be encouraged in certain cases. Self-help is also an option. Med meditation, yoga, the elimination of any and all addictions, such as walkaholism, or binge eating, feelings of emptiness and loneliness at the core of abandonment anxiety and other dysfunctional attachment styles, these feelings can be countered with meaningful activities, maybe altruistic, charitable, and with true stable friends who provide a safe haven uh, and are unlikely to abandon the patient and therefore they constitute a holding, supportive, and nourishing environment. The codependence reflexive responses to their inner turmoil are self-defeating and counterproductive. They often bring about the very outcomes she fears most. 
But these outcomes also tend to buttress her worldview. The world is hostile. I'm bound to get hurt. These are negative automatic thoughts, which can be easily and, and profitably tackled in a variety of cognitive behavioral therapies. She needs to sustain her comfort zone, abuse and abandonment are familiar to me. At least I know the ropes and how to cope with them. And this also is a form of complex negative thought. This is why she needs to exit this realm of mirrored fears and fearsome mental tumult. She should adopt new avocations, new hobbies, meet new people, maybe relocate, move to a new place, engage in non-committal, dispensable relationships, and in general, take life much more lightly. Some codependents develop a type of militant independence as a defense against their own sorely felt vulnerability, dependence. But even these daring rebels tend to view their relationships in terms of black and white, an infantile psychological defense mechanism known as splitting. They tend to regard their relationships as either doomed to failure or as everlasting, and they tend to regard their intimate partners as both unique and indispensable, soulmate, twin, or completely interchangeable and objectified. These, of course, are misperceptions. Cognitive deficits grounded in emotional maturity and thwarted personal development. All relationships have a life expectancy, a sell-by, good before or expiry date. No one is irreplaceable or completely interchangeable. Codependence problems are rooted in a profound lack of self-love and an absence of object constancy. She regards herself as unloved and unlovable when she is all by herself. Yet clinging codependent and counterdependent Firstly, de de independent, defined, intimacy, retarding behaviors. All these can be modified. If you fear abandonment to the point of phobia, I advise you to adhere to a regime of therapy and a series of steps which can be easily implemented and are listed on my website. Uh, having implemented this mini therapy, you should then seek longer term therapy. Uh, in a structured therapeutic alliance. Codependency can be overcome, can be cured if you wish, can be altered and changed into a much healthier pattern of attachment, bonding and relationships. So I advise you to head to my website www.narcissistic-abuse.com and there's a search engine there, type the word codependent and you will find um, mini therapeutical, mini therapeutic self-administered regime, which should be perhaps a first aid kit in your case. Thank you for listening. I wish you a very good conference. Some, some good upheaval in the world of borderline personality disorder. Many things we thought we knew were disproven lately and others have emerged. All in all, more optimistic news. If I had to choose between borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder as a diagnosis, I would choose borderline. There's spontaneous remission after age 40 or 45. There is DBT, which is a very effective treatment strategy. And there is growing hope day in and day out. The more we believe or the more we convince ourselves that borderline personality disorder is actually a form of hereditary brain abnormality, the more treatment horizons and medical interventions open. But even in the classical field of psychotherapy, there are mega developments. Stay with me for this ride, a literature review of the most recent studies in the world of borderline personality disorder. My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and a professor of psychology. And let's delve right in and review a new study. This study upends our perception of borderline personality disorder. Before I go there, there is enormous ignorance enormous ignorance, even among people who are supposed to know better. <clears throat> I just returned from a trip in July to Vienna, where I've met 13, 
13 psychologists and psychiatrists, 12 of whom had insisted that borderline personality disorder is actually bipolar disorder, not borderline personality disorder, as the name implies, is a personality disorder. And bipolar disorder has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's a mood disorder. And yet, these top-notch professionals didn't know the difference. In another country, Hungary, I've heard of the most credentialed, prestigious diagnostician there misdiagnosing borderline personality disorder, or actually the absence or lack thereof, egregiously. He hands down uh, diagnosis to people, telling them they do not have borderline personality disorders, because they don't self-mutilate or self-harm. This is a level of profound ignorance. In every civilized country, this man would have lost his license. Let me elucidate a bit. The absence of self-harm does not preclude a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. There are new findings and they have enormous implications when it comes to the diagnostic criteria for this disorder. And so there's a study, a recently published study, and it's titled The Hidden Borderline Patient, Patients with Borderline Personality Disorder Who Do Not Engage in Recurrent Suicidal or self Suicidal or Self-Injurious Behavior. It was published by Cambridge University Press in July 2022, and the authors are Mark Zimmerman and Lena Becker. I will summarize the study for you, and then, as is my habit, I will read to you the abstract. And so what, they, what these people are saying, what these investigators or scholars are saying, is that you don't need to self-harm or self-mutilate or cut in order to gain <laughs> The, the diagnosis of borderline or qualify for the diagnosis of personal, uh, borderline personality disorder. They chose, they selected 400 psychiatric outpatients diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. About half the participants were suicidal and they engaged in recurrent self injury, self mutilation, and self harm. The other half didn't. Then they studied these two populations, and the results showed no difference between the two groups in the degree of impairment in occupational functioning, social functioning, comorbidity of psychiatric disorders, history of childhood trauma, severity of depression, existence, presence of anxiety, anger, emptiness, etc., etc. In other words, these two populations were identical diagnostically and psychodynamically. The only single difference between them is that the people in the first group, self-injured, self-harmed, and self-mutilated, intended to have suicidal ideation, and people in the second group didn't. And yet clearly, both members, both members of both groups, qualified abundantly for a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Mark Zimmerman, who is an MD and a professor of psychiatry and human behavior in Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island, said, just because a person doesn't engage in self-harm or suicidal behavior, doesn't mean that the person is free of borderline personality disorder. Clinicians, need to screen for borderline personality disorder in patients with other suggestive symptoms, even if these patients do not self-harm, just as they would for similar patients who do self-harm. Zimmerman is also the director of the outpatient division at the Partial Hospital Program in Rhode Island Hospital. Anyhow, he published his findings in, uh, psychological, in the journal Psychological Medicine. The problem with borderline personality disorder and with all other personality disorder, disorders is that they are polythetic. 
at least in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 4, 3, and 2. This approach of making a list of diagnostic criteria prevailed over the alternative approach, which, was, which is descriptive and dimensional. So we ended up having lists. Each diagnosis had its own list of criteria. And in the case of borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder, it was sufficient to meet five of the nine criteria in order to be diagnosed with the disorder. But this created a major problem. Because, for example, you could be diagnosed with criteria one, two, three, four, and five. And then I could be diagnosed with criteria five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And both of us would qualify uh, to receive the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Yet we have almost nothing in common. Your borderline personality disorder relies on diagnostic criteria one to five. My borderline personality disorder relies on diagnostic criteria five to nine. We have extremely little in common. And this is called the polythetic problem. So there were, there were scholars and researchers and experimenters and psychologists all over the world who have spent the past two decades trying to find the single criterion which would apply to all patients with borderline personality disorder, regardless of which other criteria they had met. And they found that the only criterion which applies to 90%, that's 90% of all patients with borderline personality disorder is affective instability, also known as emotional dysregulation. Zimmerman says that affective instability had a very high negative predictive value, meaning that if you didn't have affective instability, you didn't have the disorder. Given the clinical and public health significance of suicidal and self-harm behavior in patients with BPD, an important question is whether the absence of these criteria, which might attenuate the likelihood of recognizing and diagnosing this disorder, and they identifies a subgroup of patients with borderline personality disorder who are less borderline than patients with BPD who do not manifest this criteria. In short, the issue is this. We know that 90% of patients with borderline personality disorder have emotional dysregulation, aka affective instability. We, these scholars wanted to find out whether self-harm, self-injury, self-mutilation occupies the same hallowed space. In other words, whether it was also present in the vast majority of borderline cases. And what they found is, no, the answer is no. You could definitely be borderline without any hint or trace of suicidal ideation, self-harm, self-injurious behavior, or self-mutilation. Similarly, there was no difference between any specific axis one or personality disorder and borderline personality disorder. In other words, um, the comorbidity of borderline personality disorder with other mental health disorders did not have a predictive diagnostic value. You couldn't say if this person doesn't have depression, if this person doesn't have, I don't know, some other issue, for example, grandiosity, if this person doesn't self-harm and self-mutilate and doesn't have suicidal ideation, this person is not a borderline. You can't say this. It's wrong. The only two comorbidities which have some predictive value when it comes to borderline personality disorder are generalized anxiety disorder in patients under age 45, especially very young patients, and histrionic personality disorder. Both were more frequent in the patients who did not meet the suicidal self-injury criterion. So it seems that there are two groups of borderline. Borderlines who are suicidal and self-injurious 
these borderlines would tend to have anxiety and histrionic personality disorder. And borderlines who are self-destructive, self-harming, and these borderlines would not have usually or normally or would have less uh, lower frequency of histrionic personality disorder. The patients who met the suicidality self-injury criterion were significantly more likely to have been hospitalized and reported more suicidal ideation at the time of the evaluation, wrote the researchers. There were no between group differences on severity of depression, anxiety or anger at the initial evaluation. There were no differences in social functioning, adolescent social functioning, likelihood of persistent unemployment or receiving disability benefits, childhood trauma or neglect. Both all these parameters were identical in the group who, of people who were, of patients who were suicidal and self-harming and in the group of patients who were not suicidal and were not self-injurious. All these parameters, I repeat them, social functioning, adolescent social functioning, likelihood of persistent unemployment or receiving disability benefits, childhood trauma or neglect. Zimmerman says, I suspect that there are a number of individuals whose BPD is not recognized because they don't have the more overt feature of self-injury or suicidal behavior. He he calls this hidden BPD, hidden borderline personality disorder. Repeated self-injurious and suicidal behavior, he says, is not synonymous with borderline personality disorder. And clinicians should be aware that the absence of these behaviors does not rule out a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Monica Karski is the uh, assistant professor of psychology uh, in psychiatry and a senior fellow of the Personality Disorders Institute in Weill Cornell Medical College, New York City. She has a very long list of credentials. She is also a postdoctoral manager of the postdoctoral program in psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, etc. etc. Karski suggested to stop using the model, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Edition 4 text revision model. In other words, she says, don't use the list of nine diagnostic criteria. This list is very misleading. It's very misleading. It's also culture bound. It includes gender bias and it's polythetic. It, it leads equally to comorbidity with other disorders. It's a mess. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, edition four, including the text revision, are a bloody mess. And they are a mess because they rely on lists and categories, whereas the human psyche and the human mind are not categorical. They are dimensional and they are on a spectrum. So Karski suggests to use the alternative model or the alternate model for personality disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fifth edition, text revision. In the alternative model or alternate model of borderline personality disorder, first you rate the severity level of personality. You assess identity, relationship problems, intimacy issues, self-regulation. You, you note specific traits of personality disorders. And she says this will help clinicians who dread telling patients that they are borderline. I concur wholeheartedly. The alternative model in the DSM-5 is vastly superior to anything DSM-4 has to offer. It is regrettable that the insurance industry and the ph pharmaceutical industry have both um, intimidated the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Committee into including the outdated and defunct language of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Edition 4 in the fifth edition and in the text revision. Summary of this part, you don't have to self-harm, you don't have to self-mutilate, and you don't have to be suicidal.
to qualify for a diagnostic diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. If you are emotionally dysregulated and your affect is unstable, you probably have borderline features and in all likelihood, a borderline personality disorder. So this is the article. Go to the description for a bibliography. I'm going to read to you what the authors said in the article itself. Background. Despite the significant psychosocial morbidity associated with borderline personality disorder, its under recognition is a significant clinical problem. BPD is likely underdiagnosed in part because patients with BPD usually present with chief complaints associated with mood, anxiety, and substance abuse disorders. When patients with BPD do not exhibit self-harm behavior, we suspect that BPD is less likely to be recognized. An important question is whether the absence of this criteria, which might attenuate the likelihood of recognizing and diagnosing the disorder, identifies a subgroup of patients with BPD who are less borderline than patients with BPD who do not manifest this criteria. The results are this. Approximately half of the patients with BPD did not meet the suicidality self-injury diagnostic criterion for the disorder. There were no differences between the patients who did and did not meet this criterion in terms of occupational impairment, likelihood of receiving disability payments, impairment in social functioning, level of educational achievement, comorbid psychiatric disorders, history of childhood trauma, or severity of depression, anxiety, or anger upon presentation for treatment. And just correcting one thing, the only exceptions are generalized anxiety disorder in patients under age 40 and histrionic personality disorder throughout the lifespan. These two are, are correlated with borderline personality disorder. The comorbidity is significant, statistically speaking. The conclusions of the study, repeated self-injurious and suicidal behavior is not synonymous with borderline personality disorder. It is critical for clinicians to be aware that the absence of repeated self-injury and suicide threats or gestures or attempts does not rule out the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Onward to the next article. It identified a new treatment modality for borderline personality disorder. Hitherto, we have had mostly dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. DBT has been extremely efficacious. Well over 50% of patients lost the diagnosis within one year. The DBT involved a group element and an individual therapy element. To this very day, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, is the gold standard for treating borderline personality disorder. And here comes another possibility, another possibility. I'm referring to an article titled The Effectiveness of Predominantly Group Schema Therapy and Combined Individual and Group Schema Therapy for Borderline Personality Disorder, a randomized clinical trial. The lead author is Arnold Arntz, A-R-N-T-Z. I will read to you the key points and findings from the study itself, but I want to discuss it a bit beforehand. What the study shows is that if you were to combine individual schema therapy with group schema therapy, you would accomplish a reduction of symptoms, a substantial reduction of symptoms in patients with borderline personality disorder. That's a new tool in our arsenal Schema is a form of psychotherapy that focuses on the experience, on experiential uh, approach. Uh, it's not so focused on behavior change. It teaches you how to manage your experience in ways which render you more functional and definitely more self-aware. This study, again, the lead author was Dr. Arnud Arns. This study was an international randomized control trial. And what the study found was that it's not enough to offer individual 
schema therapy. You need to couple it with group schema therapy. And so what Dr. Ahn says is, in the Netherlands, there's a big push from mental health institutes to deliver treatments in group therapy only, because people think it's more cost effective. But my, these findings question this idea. The findings were published in a very prestigious academic journal, Journal of American Medicine Association, Medical Association, Psychiatry. The study characterizes borderlines, a borderline personality disorder a bit idiosyncratically, I must say. There, many scholars would disagree with some of the characteristics of borderline personality disorder as incorporated in this study. The study says that patients with borderline personality disorder exhi exhibit extreme sensitivity to interpersonal slights. This kind of hypervigilance is actually much more typical in narcissistic personality disorder, not in borderline personality disorder. The study says that patients with BPD have intense and volatile emotions, which is true, as we've seen in the previous study. Impulsive behaviors, also true. Many of them abuse drugs, self-harm, or attempt suicide. Wrong, it seems. About half of them do not many of them. At any rate, borderline personality disorder is by and large captured appropriately in the study. So we can't disqualify the study uh, as having, as having uh, explored other mental health disorders. It's people, patients in the study were clearly borderline. And when we look at Evidence-based recommendations by various psychiatric and psychological associations around the world, the usual first venue or first resort is psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is the primary treatment for people presenting with what appears to be borderline personality disorder. And so we need many more therapies. Classical therapies such as psychoanalysis or cognitive, even cognitive behavioral therapy have proven to be inefficacious with borderline, hence the modification of DBT. Schema therapy uses techniques from traditional psychotherapy, but it focuses, as I said, on ex an experiential strategy. It delves into early childhood experiences. And in the case of borderline personality disorder, this is very relevant because in the vast majority of patients with borderline personality disorder, we do find adverse childhood experiences, trauma, abuse, and neglect in early life. That is not to say that borderline personality disorder is not a brain abnormality. It's not to say that there is no genetic or hereditary component in borderline. It seems that people who go on to develop borderline personality disorder as early as childhood, in childhood or adolescence, are people who have a propensity, a proclivity, a predilection to develop borderline personality disorder, genetically or cerebrally in the brain. In other words, these people are somehow predisposed to develop borderline personality disorder because they have defective genes or brain abnormalities. But the trigger is environmental, nurture, not nature. In the absence of abuse, trauma and neglect in early childhood, you're very unlikely to develop borderline personality disorder, even if you have all the genes and all the brain abnormalities. So schema therapy seems to be very relevant. With this approach, therapists take on a kind of parenting role, and they try to meet the needs of these patients that were not met in early childhood. The patient is perceived as a frustrated child and the role of the therapist is to help the patient grow up and mature by acting the parent. Previous research had suggested that both individual and group schema therapy help to reduce BPD symptoms. But what this study sh shows is that if you, if you were to combine individual and group schema therapy, the, the benefit is, becomes exponential. Treatment retention is also higher when you combine the therapy. 
this improvement in, in multiple secondary outcomes, happiness, quality of life, patient, report, patient reports an enhanced sense of well-being. Still, just to put things in perspective, outcomes in society or, or in work are more improved in DBT than they are in this combined approach. I want to be clear, combining individual schema therapy and group schema therapy um, does improve societal and work functioning patterns and outcomes, but not as much as DBT. Um, so Arndt says that group therapy seems to offer something that is important for learning to cooperate with other people. At work, you often have to collaborate with people who are not necessarily your friends. It's the same approach in DBT, by the way. There's a, a very power, very strong dominant group element there. The number of suicide attempts among patients exposed to combined schema therapy, the number of suicide attempts declined over time. The combination proved to be significantly superior to treatment as usual. During the study period, three patients died of suicide, one in each treatment arm. Uh, another, the third one was not, it wasn't clear that it was suicide. So these are three out of hundreds. It's a major improvement in, in the statistics of suicide in typical borderline groups. Overall, the results suggest that group and individual sessions address different needs of patients, said the investigators. While patients may learn to get along with others in a group setting, they may be more comfortable discussing severe trauma or suicidal ideation or thoughts in one-on-one -on -one sessions with the therapist. So let me read to you uh, from the study. And again, go to the description. There's a bibliography with a list of all these studies and where to find them. Let me read to you the key points of the study. The question was, is group schema therapy for borderline personality disorder more effective than optimal treatment as usual? And is predominantly group schema therapy or combined individual and group schema therapy more effective? The findings. In this randomized clinical trial, which included 495 adult participants with borderline personality disorder in five countries, combined individual and group schema therapy was significantly more effective than optimal treatment as usual and predominantly group schema therapy. So the combination was much more effective in reducing BPD severity. The findings add to the evidence for the effectiveness of schema therapy for borderline personality disorder and indicate that the combination of individual and group schema therapy is the more effect effective schema therapy for MUD. Okay, let's go on to the next study. And the next study kind of challenges the common orthodox wisdom in all the treatment guidelines that I'm aware of all over the world. If this study is replicated and supported by other studies, we have been doing things wrong for decades. According to this study, and in a minute I'll read to you the title of this study, give me a minute. Effect of three forms of early intervention for young people with borderline personality disorder. The MOBY, M-O-B-Y, randomized clinical trial. The lead author is Andrew Chanen, C-H-A-N-E-N. -E and as usual, I'll first analyze the study and then read to you from the study. What the study says is that early interventions that focus on clinical case management and psychiatric care and not on individual psychotherapy are more effective for young patients with borderline personality disorder. Now you remember that we can diagnose and do diagnose borderline personality disorder as early as 12 years old. It's not the case with narcissistic and antisocial personality disorder, which are diagnosed only after age 18 or sometimes 21. Borderline can be diagnosed very, very early on in life. And so we have patients 
they're underage and we need to treat them somehow. And hitherto, all the treatment guidelines all over the world said that what you do with such a young patient is give him or her psychotherapy. And what this study says, it's the wrong approach. You should focus on case clinical, uh, clinical case management. You should focus on psychiatric care, including medication. And there is this trial, big trial, called Monitoring Outcomes of Borderline Personality Disorder in Youth, the MOBI trial, M-O-B-Y trial. It showed improved psychosocial functioning and reduced suicidal ideation uh, with early psychiatric intervention and case management. So the results of this study suggest that psychotherapy is not the only or even first effective approach for early BPD. Dr. Chainan is the Director of Clinical Programs and Services and Head of Personality Disorder Research at Origin, Melbourne, Australia. And he told, he said, we can say that early diagnosis and early treatment is effective and the treatment doesn't need to involve individual psychotherapy, but does need to involve clinical case management and psychiatric care. Patients with BPD have extreme sensitivity to interpersonal slides and exhibit all kinds of volatile emotions and impulsive behavior. As we said, many self-harm, abuse drugs, attempt suicide. The suicide rate among patients with borderline personality disorder, to remind you, is anywhere between 8 and 11 percent, depending on the country. The condition is diagnosed in puberty or early adulthood, and it affects about 3 percent of young people. Um, luckily for, for humanity, many of these young people grow out of their borderline personality disorder. There are two waves where you can lose the diagnosis between ages 12 and 21, and then after age 45. Only one third of young adults or adolescents diagnosed with borderline personality disorder go on to become adults with the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. But these patients, young patients, they are volatile, they're labile, they're dysregulated, they're aggressive, they have enormous interpersonal difficulties and they are discriminated against by health professionals. They don't get treated. Those that are treated are often shunted off to some therapist once a month or something, and they receive individual psychotherapy. A very small percentage of them end up in dialectical behavior therapy program. The, and so, in, let me be clear, individual psychotherapy is a good thing. These therapies, especially DBT, teach you healthy ways to cope with stress and to regulate emotions. And so these therapies are highly effective. But the MOBI trial examined three treatment approaches, not only one. The first treatment approach is called the Help Young People Early model, HYPE. The second is HYPE combined with weekly befriending. And the third was a general youth mental health service, uh, YMHS model, combined with befriending. So a key element of HYPE is cognitive analytic therapy. It's a, it's a psychotherapy program focused on understanding problematic self-management and interpersonal relationship patterns. The model also include, includes clinical case management, for example, housing, vocational and educational issues, other mental health needs, comorbidities like depression and anxiety, medication, physical health needs. In the second model, psychotherapy of the high program is replaced. You have all the elements of ca clinical case management, but instead of psychotherapy, you have befriending. Befriending means chatting with the patients, with the patient. The chats are about neutral topics, I don't know, sports, avoiding emotionally loaded topics, avoiding actually not discussing interpersonal problems. And the third approach was YMHS plus befriending. It's when you tr the, the uh, experts trained, uh, trained young people. 
they they gave the young people therapy, they managed the patients, but these therapists were not specialists in BPD. So the third approach is what we call what we call as usual treatment or treatment as usual approach. Um, therapists, psychologists who are not experts and scholars of BPD, but but treat BPD as well. All patients across all three groups had marked and sustained improvements in ways you wouldn't expect for borderline personality disorder. Interventions have a true effect, especially in childhood and puberty. The results suggest that early diagnosis and not very complicated treatment or even just chatting to someone drastically improves the lives of these young people, says Ch Chainan. The results also imply that there are effective alternatives to mere treatment as usual psychotherapy. The insistence of the field by many scholars and many institutions and many um, uh, treatment guidelines, the insistence that only therapy works in BPD is wrong. Chainan says, this study turns things upside down and says actually that psychotherapy is not the single modality. It's the basics of treatment that are important, not which treatment. When a patient presents at an emergency department following, for example, um, severe overdose, clinicians reflexively refer that person to a psychotherapy program. But the problem is these programs are not built to service the needs of suicidal borderline personality disorder patients. They are kind of canvassing programs. And most of the workers in these programs, albeit with academic degrees in psychology, are not experts in the extremely convoluted and complicated dynamic of borderline personality disorder. The skills for Clinical case management and psychiatric care are very specialized. So this is the this is the study. John Oldham, who is a distinguished emerit, emeritus professor in the Manninger, Manninger Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas, Oldham says the general standard approach in psychiatry and the diagnostic world has been to not even consider anything until after somebody, somebody is 18 years of age, which is a mistake because these kids can become quite impaired much earlier than that, he says incorrectly. Oldham was not involved in, in this study. Ironically, he was one of the main contributors and authors of the very treatment guidelines which are undermined by this study. <laughs> And yet, amazingly at his age, and with his renome and track record, Oldham is an example of a good scientist. A scientist who is open to new information. Scientist who is capable of modifying his views very substantially when exposed to new findings. Oldham says there is an emerging trend towards good psychiatric management that focuses on level of functioning, rather than on a specific strategy requiring a certificate of training that not many people out there have, Oldham says. You're not going to make much headway, he, he concludes, with these kids. You're not going to make much headway with these kids if you are going to be searching around for a DBT certified therapist. What you need is to bring them in, get them to trust you, and in a sense to be a kind of overall behavioral medicine navigator for them. Let me read to you from the study, as I usually do. By the way, the study comes with a, with a beautiful graphic. And so the study, the key points are, question, what combination of treatment components is sufficient for early intervention for young people with borderline personality disorder? And the findings in this randomized clinical trial with 139 youth with borderline personality disorder, a dedicated BPD service model and a specialized BPD psychotherapy were associated with superior retention in care, but not a superior rate 
of change in psychological functioning by 12 months. And this is compared with general youth mental health care and a psychotherapy controlled condition. Effective early intervention for BPD is not reliant on availability of BPD psychotherapy. In, this is a major change in orientation. It means that when we are confronted with a young BPD patient, we should immediately take care of all the aspects of his functioning and his life. We should befriend him and we, sh we, should, offer, offer an, we should offer a complete, a total solution, not focus on psychotherapy, which often doesn't work or works less effectively. And there are very few people qualified to administer it. And so now I want to review six studies of psychosocial interventions. It is an article titled Borderline Personality Disorder, Six Studies of Psychosocial Interventions by Sai Atezaz Said and Ange Angela Kallis, K-A-L-L-I-S. It was published in the Journal of Current Psychiatry in 2002. So the first study um, is by Zanarini, Konki, and Temis. But before we go there, a reminder of what is borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is a serious impairment in, on multiple levels and in multiple areas of life, starting or with emotional dysregulation and affect instability. But psychosocial functioning is severely affected. There's an ongoing pattern of mood instability or ability, cognitive distortions, problems with self-image, impulsive behavior that often results in problems in the workplace and in relationships. Patients with BPD tend to utilize more mental health services than patients with any other mental health disorder or even with major depressive disorder. Many clinicians believe that BPD is very difficult to treat. This is no longer true. This hasn't been true for decades, but the stigma lingers on. Historically, there's been little consensus on the best treatments for these disorders. And currently, we use pharmacologic and psychological interventions in combination. And so I want to review six studies very briefly. So again, the first one is titled Randomized Control Trial of Web-Based Psychoeducation for Women with Borderline Personality Disorder. It was published in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry in 2018. The authors are Zanarini, Konki, and Temis. I'm reading the abstract. Research has shown that BPD is a treatable illness with a more favorable prognosis than previously believed. Despite this, patients often experience difficulty accessing the most up-to-date information on BPD, which can impede their treatment. A 2008 study by Zanarini et allies of younger female patients with BPD demonstrated that immediate in-person psychoeducation improved impulsivity and relationships. Widespread implementation of this program proved problematic, however, due to cost and personnel constraints. To resolve this issue, researchers developed an internet-based version of the program. In a 2018 follow-up study, Zanarini and his collaborators examined the effect of this internet-based psychoeducation program on symptoms of BPD. And the outcomes were pretty astonishing. In the acute phase, treatment group participants experienced statistically significant improvements in all 10 endpoints and outcomes. Um, it seems that in patients with BPD, internet-based psychoeducation reduced symptom severity and improved psychosocial functioning with effects lasting up to one year. Treatment group participants experienced clinically significant improvements in all outcomes measured during the acute phase of the study. Most improvements may, were maintained over one year. So this is pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, 
a pretty interesting study. The next study is a randomized trial of brief dialectical behavioral therapy skills training in suicidal patients suffering from borderline disorder. It was published in ACTA Psychiatry uh, Scandinavia, Scandinavia 2017. The authors were McCain and Guimont and Bounhardt. And so they said, standard dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, is an effective treatment for BPD. However, access is often limited by shortages of clinicians and resources. Therefore, it has become increasingly common for clinical settings to offer patients only the skills training component of DPD, which requires fewer resources. While several clinical trials examining brief DPD, DBT skills, only treatment for PPD. So while several clinical trials examining this uh, shortened or condensed version of DPD for BPD, these studies have shown promising results. It is unclear how effective this kind of intervention is at reducing suicidal or non-suicidal self-injury episodes. So the study explored the effectiveness of brief DPD, DBT skills, only adjunctive treatment on the rates of suicide and NSSI episodes in patients with BPD. I'll summarize this for you. DPD is expensive, DPD is, co DPD is costly, DPD, DBT requires training. DBT is not available everywhere to everyone. So there's a sort of zip a sort of zipped or condensed version of DBT, which offers only skills training. The authors try to find out if BPD patients subjected to abridged DBT, the skills training component of DBT, if these patients um, responded favorably to the treatment by reducing rates of suicide and self-injury, which was not suicide. And so the outcomes were that the DBT group showed statistically significant greater reductions in the frequency of suicidal and NSSI episodes. So the DBT group experienced statistically significant improvements in distress tolerance and emotion regulations, uh, but no difference on mindfulness. The DBT group achieved greater reductions in anger over time so it seems that, yes, uh, there are impacts. Even if we use only a single component of DBT, it already has massive effects on multiple very crucial dimensions of BPD. The DBT group showed significant improvements in social adjustment, symptom distress, and borderline symptoms, but no significant uh, change in impulsivity. Um, clinical improvements were the statistics, the statistical measures are very significant, so it's pretty safe to say that these, these outcomes are real. The conclusions are brief DBT skills training reduced suicidal and NSSI, NSSI self-injury episodes in patients with BPD. Participants in the DBT group also demonstrated greater improve improvements in anger, distress tolerance, and emotion regulation compared to the control group. These results were evident three months after treatment. However, any gains in healthcare utilization, social adjustment, symptom distress, and borderline symptoms diminished or did not differ from the other participants at week 32. At that time, Participants in the DBT group demonstrated a similar level of sym symptomatology as the control group. So this, is, this was the second study. The next study is titled Combined Therapy with Interpersonal Psychotherapy Adapted for Borderline Personality Disorder. A two years follow-up was published in uh, Psychiatry um, Research Psychiatry Research in 2016. The authors are Bozzatello and Bellino. Ah, I love Italian. How musical. The study um, was interesting. It says that psychotherapeutic options for treating BPD, BPD including DBT, mentalization-based treatment, schema-focused therapy, transference-based psychotherapy, 
and systems training for emotional predictability and problem solving. All these are psycho psychotherapeutic options, but they're not widely available. More recently, interpersonal therapy also has been adopted for BPD. It is known as IPT-BPD. However, thus far, say the authors, no trials have investigated the long-term effects of this particular therapy on BPD. In 2010, Bellino et al. published a 32-week study examining the effect of IPT-BPD on BPD. They concluded that IPT-BPD, in other words, interpersonal therapy adapted for BPD. They concluded that IPT-BPD plus uh, Prozac was superior to Prozac alone in improving symptoms and quality of life. The present study by Bozatello et al. examined whether the benefits of IPT-BPD plus Prozac demonstrated in the 2010 study persisted over a 24-month follow-up. And so the outcomes were, while the original study demonstrated that combined therapy had a clinically significant effect of a Prozac alone on, on BPD, this advantage was maintained only at the six-month assessment. The improvement that the combined therapy provided over a Prozac monotherapy with regards to impulsivity and interpersonal relationships, as well as factors of social and psychological functioning at 32 weeks, were preserved at 24 months. No additional improvements have been seen. The conclusions of the study are that the improvements in impulsivity, interpersonal functioning, social functioning, and psychological functioning at 32 weeks seen with IPT, BPD plus Prozac, compared with Prozac alone, persisted for two years after completing therapy, but no further improvements were seen. The improvements to anxiety, and effective instability that combined therapy demonstrated over Prozac monotherapy at 32 weeks when not maintained after 24 months. So the next study is favorable outcome of long-term combined psychotherapy for patients with borderline personality disorder. Six year follow-up of a randomized study. Again, in psychotherapy research, 2017, the authors were Antonsen, Kvarstein, Stein, and Ernest. <laughs> While many studies have demonstrated the benefits of psychotherapy for treating personality disorders, say the authors, there is limited research of how different levels of psychotherapy may impact treatment outcomes. Uh, there is something called the Ulebal Personality Project. It compared an intensive combined treatment program with outpatient individual psychotherapy in patients with personality disorders. The combined treatment program consisted of short-term day hospital treatment followed by outpatient combined group and individual psychotherapy. The outcomes evaluated included suicide attempts, suicidal thoughts, self-injury, psychosocial functioning, symptom distress, and interpersonal and personality problems. A six-year follow-up concluded that there were no differences in outcomes between the two treatment groups. However, the authors examined whether combined uh, therapy, the combined psychotherapy, produced statistically significant benefits over the outpatient therapy in a subset of patients with borderline personality disorder. So you remember that the, the group included many types of personality disorders. So these authors wanted to home in, to focus on patients with borderline personality disorder and to see whether combined therapy were, was superior to outpatient therapy in the case of BPD only. So they discovered that when it comes to BPD, borderline personality disorder, compared to the outpatient group, the combined psychotherapy group demonstrated statistically significant reductions in, symptoms, in symptom distress at year six, and between years three and six, the combined psychotherapy group continued to show improvements in psychosocial functioning. So the outpatient psychotherapy group uh, worsened during this time, 
the scores of these group worsened during this study compared to the out group uh, to the outpatient group participant participants in the composite group also had significantly better outcomes on multiple domains of self-control and identity integration there were no significant differences between groups on the proportion of participants who engage in self-harm or experience, experience suicidal thoughts or attempts. There were no significant differences in outcomes between the treatment groups in all these domains. Participants in the, control, in the composite group tended to use fewer psychotropic medications than those in the outpatient groups over time, but this difference was not statistically significant. The two groups did not differ in the use of healthcare services over the last year. Avoidant personality disorder did not have a significant moderator effect in this case. Comorbid avoidant personality disorder was actually a negative predictor, independent of the group. Both groups experienced a remission rate of 90% at six year follow up. Compared with the outpatient group, participants in the com composite group experienced significantly greater reductions in symptom distress and improvements in self-control and identity integration at six years. So this is, this is the, the study. The next study is eight-year prospective follow-up of mentalization-based treatment versus structured clinical management for people with borderline personality disorder. It was published in the Journal of Personality Disorders, 2021, and the authors are Bateman, Constantinou, and Fonagy. They say, the efficacy of various psychotherapies for symptoms of BPD have, have been, has been well established. However, there is limited evidence that these effects persist over time. In 2009, Bateman and others conducted an 18-month study comparing the effectiveness of outpatient mentalization-based treatment, MBT, against structured clinical management for patients with BPD. Both groups experienced substantial improvements, but patients assigned to mentalization-based treatment demonstrated greater improvement in clinically significant problems, including suicide attempts and hospitalization. In a 2021 follow-up to this study, Bateman and allies investigated whether the MBT group, the mentalization group, the gains in this group in the primary outcomes, absence of severe self-harm, suicide attempts and inpatient admissions in the previous 12 months, the gains in social functioning, the gains in vocational engagement, mental health service usage, whether these gains were maintained throughout an eight-year follow-up period. And so the outcomes were that the number of participants who met diagnostic criteria for BPD at the one-year follow-up was significantly lower at the mentalization-based group compared with the other group. To improve participant retention, this outcome was not evaluated at later visits. The number of participants who achieved the primary recovery criteria of the original trial, to remind you, absence of self-harm, suicide attempts, and inpatient admissions, the number of patients who achieved these primary recovery criteria and remained well throughout the entire follow-up period was significantly higher in the mentalization group compared with the other group. The average number of years through during which participants fail, failed to meet recovery criteria was significantly greater in the other group compared to the mentalization group. When controlling for age, treatment group was a significant predictor of re recovery during the follow-up period. Overall, significantly fewer participants in the mentalization group experienced critical incidents during the follow-up period, which was a very long follow-up period. Yeah? The other group, the non-mentalization group, used crisis health, uh, mental health uh, services for a significantly greater number of follow-up follow years than the mentalization group. The likelihood of using crisis services did not statistically differ between the groups, but the first group, the non-mentalization group, used these services much more. MBT group participants spent more time in education, were less likely to be unemployed, 
were less likely to use social care interventions than the other group. People in the MBT group spent more months engaged in purposeful activity, etc., etc. They received, uh, they had fewer months of of psychotherapeutic medication compared with the other group, and so on. The study demonstrated that patients with BPD significantly benefited from specialized therapies such as mentalization-based therapy. At the one-year follow-up, the number of participants who met diagnostic criteria for BPD was significantly lower in the mentalization group. The number of participants who achieved the primary recovery criteria and remained well during the eight-year follow-up period was also significantly higher in the mentalization group. So mentalization is a third option after DBT and schema therapy. And finally, a sigh of relief. Finally, the article, an article titled Effectiveness and Safety of the Adjunctive Use of an Internet-Based Self-Management Intervention for Borderline Personality Disorder, in addition to care as usual, results from a randomized controlled trial. It was published in, BM, in the uh, BMJ, op, uh, Open Access BMJ, 2021. Author, the authors are Klein, Hauer, and Berger. They say fewer than one in four patients with BPD have access to effective psychotherapies. The use of internet-based self-management interventions developed from evidence-based psychotherapies can help close this treatment gap. Although the efficacy of internet for several mental health disorders has been demonstrated in multiple meta-analyses, meta -analyses, results for BPD are mixed. In this study, Klein and allies examined the effectiveness and safety of the adjunctive use of an internet-based self-management self intervention based on schema therapy, in addition to care as usual in patients with BPD. So the outcomes were there, was a, there were large reductions in the severity of BPD symptoms as measured by in, in various ways um, in people who used an inter internet-based intervention method. And this difference um, was statistically significant. There was no st statistically significant difference in the number of serious adverse events between the two groups. So the conclusion was that treatment with an internet-based intervention module did not result in improved outcomes over care as usual. Although the average reduction was greater in this group compared to the reduction in symptoms, was greater in this group compared to the control group, this difference was not statistically significant. The authors uh, believe that because many of the patients were receiving psychotherapy, the study should be taken with a grain of salt. But it's interesting. It's interesting because many people resort to the internet as a first, as a first option. You know, support groups, forums, even internet-based psychotherapy. This study seems to indicate that it's not working. Many groundbreaking and earth-shattering discoveries. I thought I'd bring them to your attention. Thank you for surviving. I'll see you next time. Good afternoon, dear students. This is a half credit uh, lecture for the CIAPS outreach program of CIAS, Center for International Advanced Professional Studies, those of you who had forgotten during the pandemic. And another thing you had forgotten is to hand in your assignments. Half of you, more than half of you, haven't done so. I don't know, you're twiddling your th thumbs or shudder the thought, twiddling some other part of you. So quit twiddling and start handing in, submitting your assignments from the last lecture. Last lectures, actually. Okay, enough with hectoring and preaching. Today we are going to discuss meaning, meaning 
the role of meaning in therapy. Now we are going to use three examples, three treatment modalities, three therapies, which have based themselves explicitly on the meaning of life, on introducing meaning, context and sense into the client's life, or deriving meaning, context and sense out of the patient's or client's life and the way he describes his life, also known in clinical terms as personal narrative. Meaning is a very important thing. I tend to agree with Viktor Frankl, who had suggested that Freud got it essentially wrong when he said that life revolves around pleasure, that Adler got it wrong when he had suggested that life revolves around power, and that life actually revolves around making sense, significance, meaning, direction, goal, purpose, structure, and order. In this sense, Jordan Peterson is right when he posits chaos against order and claims that order is the key to mental health. And so today we are going to discuss meaning. How do we introduce meaning into a life that ostensibly is chaotic, is all over the place, discombobulated, disintegrated? How do we, how do we impose structure and order on people who decompensate, who defiantly and contumaciously react, reactants, on people who confuse external objects and internal objects. In short, how do we make sense of mental illness? And once we make sense of the lives of the mentally ill, do they stop being mentally ill? Is this the key? Were these people simply anomic? Were people, are people with mental illness simply people who fail to make sense of the world, of their lives, who find no meaning, no purpose, no direction, no structure, no order? Is this why many of them end up in hermeneutic, explanatory and organizing systems like religion? Because there they find what they're missing. And are these solutions, like religion, not much worse than the problem? Swapping one delusion for another, one illusion for another, is this an acceptable mental health strategy? But we tend to do this a lot in our daily lives. What is love? What is love if not a delusional disorder? By the way, biochemically in the brain, it resembles very much a mental health disorder. I refer you to my video on this YouTube channel uh, titled Love is a Pathology, where I summarize the latest findings. Love is indistinguishable, or more precisely, the stage of limerence, the stage of infatuation, is indistinguishable from mental illness. And I'm talking about the brain, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So here we swap one, one intolerable situation, a meaningless life, for a delusion called love, because love structures our lives. Love gives us direction, purpose, goal, etc. In extreme cases, love deteriorates into stalking. Similarly, substance abuse, drugs, alcohol, they provide an exoskeleton. They imbue life with meaning, and that's why they are so difficult to eradicate, to reverse. That's why rehab, rehab is a spectacular failure. <laughs> Because rehab tackles the psychological and physiological elements of addiction, but does not tackle the nomological, the axiological aspects, the lack of meaning in the addict's life. So today I would like to discuss three treatment modalities um, which leverage meaning, use meaning as a healing tool. Let's start with the power threat meaning framework, PTMF or PTM framework. And I want to read to you what these people say about themselves. The PT PTMF framework was developed by both 
uh, psychologists and psychiatrists. This was one group of psychologists and psychiatrists, and they teamed up. They teamed up with social workers, neighborhood activists, and so on. So they went down. They went. They 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 went to the grass grassroots. They they went to the neighborhoods. They went to homeless people. They went to mentally ill people. They went to mental asylum. I mean, they they dirtied their hands. They didn't stay in the lab or in this lecture hall and just theorize. And you know, they didn't um, they didn't consider themselves public intellectuals. They considered themselves frontline health workers, and they collaborated with everyone who was fighting back, battling against the pandemic of mental illness because that's by far a pandemic that's larger than COVID or anything else we have known. About one third of the adult population in most Western countries is diagnosed with a major mental illness. So the power threat meaning framework, and now I'm reading from their own publication, is a new perspective on why people sometimes experience a whole range of forms of distress, confusion, fear, despair, and trouble or troubling behavior. And it is an alternative to the more traditional models based on psychiatric diagnosis. It was co-produced with service users and applies not just to people who have been in contact with the mental health or criminal justice systems, but to all of us. The framework summarizes and integrates a great deal of evidence about the role of various kinds of power in people's lives, the kinds of threat that misuses of power pose to us, and the ways we have learned as human beings to respond to threat. In traditional mental health practice, these threat responses are sometimes called symptoms. The framework also looks at how we make sense of these difficult experiences and how messages from wider society can increase our feelings of shame self-blame, isolation, fear, and guilt. That's a bit, I'm, I'm just cutting off right here to interject and say that it's very reminiscent of Pete Walker's rendition of flight, fight, fawn, and freeze responses. Um, and I encourage you to have a look at that part of his work. He got it completely wrong on emotional flashbacks and many other things, but he, he, he expostulates uh, very wisely and deeply and profoundly on these four types of responses. Continue with the text. The main aspects of the framework are summarized in these questions, which can apply to individuals, families, or social groups. Number one, what has happened to you? How is power operating in your life? Number two, how did it affect you? What kind of threats does this pose? Number three, what sense did you make of it? What is the meaning of these situations and experiences to you? Number four, what did you have to do to survive? What kinds of threat response are you using? In addition, the two questions below help us to think about what skills and resources people might have and how we might pull all these ideas and responses together into a personal narrative or a story. And this story comprises a few other questions or answers a few other questions. For example, what are your strengths? What access to power resources do you have? What is your story? How does it all fit together? So you see, this framework relies heavily on narrative construction. And there's a firm underlying assumption that by constructing a reasonable, internally consistent and externally consistent narrative, one can derive meaning, and that meaning empowers, and that empowerment is the first step towards healing and the disappearance of what we call today in traditional psychiatry, symptoms. I'm continuing from the text of the PTM framework. Possible uses of the PTM framework. framework. The power threat meaning frame, framework can be used as a way of helping people to create more hopeful narratives or stories about their lives and the difficulties they may have faced or are still facing, instead of seeing themselves as blameworthy, weak, deficient, or quote-unquote 
mentally ill. The power threat meaning framework highlights the links between wider social factors such as poverty, discrimination and inequality, inequality along with traumas such as abuse and violence and the resulting emotional distress or troubled behavior. The framework also shows why those of us who do not have an obvious history of trauma or adversity can still struggle to find a sense of self-worth, meaning and identity. The framework describes the many different strategies people use from automatic bodily reactions, somatization, to deliberately chosen ways of coping with overwhelming emotions, in regulating emotions, in order to survive and protect themselves and meet their core needs. The framework suggests a wide range of ways that may help people to move forward. For some people, this may be therapy or other standard interventions, including, if they help someone to cope, psychiatric drugs. But for other people, the main needs will be for practical help, for resources, perhaps along with peer support, art, music, exercise, nutrition, community activism, and so on. Underpinning all of this, the framework offers a new perspective on distress, which takes us beyond the individual and shows that we are all part of a wider struggle for a fairer society. One of the most important aspects of the framework is the attempt to outline common or typical patterns in the ways people respond to the negative impacts of power. In other words, patterns of meaning-based responses to threat. When we are confronted with threat, we seek meaning. This part of the framework, like all of it, is still a process in development. However, the evidence summarized in the framework does suggest that there are common ways in which people in a particular culture are likely to respond to certain kinds of threat, such as being excluded, rejected, trapped, coerced, or shamed. It may be useful to draw on these patterns to help develop people's personal stories. These general patterns can help to give people a message of acceptance and validation. The patterns can also assist us in designing services that meet people's real needs, as well as suggesting ways of accessing support benefits, and so on, that are not dependent on having a diagnosis. In addition, the framework offers a way of thinking about culturally specific understandings of distress without seeing them through a Western diagnostic model. So, in other words, the framework is not culture-bound. It doesn't crucially, critically depend <clears throat> on a cultural context, a societal context, or a context of the period in history in which it operates. The framework encourages, I'm continuing from the text, the framework encourages respect for the many creative and non-medical ways of supporting people around the world and the varied forms of narrative and healing practices that are used across cultures. And in concluding remarks, they say, taking the PTM framework further, it is important to note that power threat meaning is an overarching framework which is not intended to replace all the ways we currently think about and work with distress. Instead, the aim is to support and strengthen the many examples of good practice which already exist, while also suggesting new ways forward. The framework has wider implications than therapeutic or clinical work. The main document, and they're referring to a specific foundation document, suggests how it can offer constructive alternatives in the areas of service design and commissioning professional training, research, service user involvement, and public information. There are also important implications for social policy and the wider role of equality and social justice. It is a work in progress offered as a resource for any individuals, groups, or organizations interested in developing it further. And I add that this framework has, is proving its value and its relevance, especially now during the pandemic, when traditional tools have been taken away from us, when we have been isolated and alienated from the familiar, when everything, including loved ones, can be perceived as a threat, and where whatever happens outside makes no sense whatsoever, and so our lives are rendered increasingly more meaningless. 
So the framework can help you restore meaning, create a new narrative, which will empower you in different ways and allow you to reintegrate with people, familiar people and new people. I strongly encourage you to delve into this. Everything is available online. They welcome contributors and contributions. Contributions, I don't mean money, Con intellectual contributions, ideas, observations, shared experiences. They welcome all of you. So I strongly encourage. Now, the second treatment modality I would like to discuss, typically immodestly, is my own. I had developed a treatment modality called, called dubbed cold therapy. Cold, like in cold, brr, cold therapy. Cold therapy, now with its extension, nothingness, nothingness narrative construction. Cold therapy and nothingness narrative construction is all about meaning. I actually started my work on cold therapy by rereading Frankel's writings, and we will we'll come to Viktor Frankl a bit later. But cold therapy is about me. A cold therapy is a therapy that eliminates grandiosity. It eliminates grandiosity in narcissistic disorders of the self, including narcissistic personality disorder. And it eliminates grandiosity in depressive narratives. A big source, perhaps the biggest source of depression, dysphoria, anhedonia in people is the discrepancy between their expectations, their self-image, their self-perception, which is often inflated, illu illusory, delusional, grandiose, and reality. And I call this the grandiosity gap. Cold therapy works well with narcissists and with people, with depressive people, people with depressive illnesses, precisely because both narcissism and depression share a common etiology, the grandiosity gap, the gap between reality and how you would have liked to see yourself, what Freud called the ego ideal. Now, here's the thing. Grandiosity is a cognitive deficit. It impairs reality testing. Of course, it distorts input from the outside to fit into the grandiose narrative. So in this sense, grandiosity and its agent, the false self, they provide the narcissist and the depressive with meaning. The false self is a narrative. It's a piece of fiction. It's a story. It's a movie. And it provides meaning, context, purpose, direction, goal, it has explanatory power and organizing structure, organizing power to, to generate structure and order in the narcissist's life. So when we take away the grandiosity, when we take away the false self, we actually dismantle the false self. Cold therapy is about dismantling the false self in narcissism and to some extent in depressive patients. So when you take away these, the, you take away the main engine of meaning in the narcissist's life. The narcissist is left with a life that appears to be arbitrary, capricious, threatening, hostile, meaningless. No context, no sense, no direction, no purpose, no nothing, no structure, no order. The narcissist drifts like a feather in a hurricane. He, he loses his bearings. He has no, no inner compass. The false self is an exoskeleton. It's an external skeleton. Very similar to an addiction. It has the same psychodynamic function, functions of an addiction. It provides a narcissist with an external skeleton, something that holds him together. We take away this skeleton, take away this scaffolding, and the whole edifice of the narcissist crumbles because it's a house of cards. So when we take away the false self in cold therapy, we take away meaning. Now, this meaning is delusional. It's pathological. It's based on a severe cognitive deficit. It has little to do with reality, so it impairs reality testing. It's not healthy, it's not good. The precondition for healing is to take away this distorted meaning and the generator of this meaning, which is the false self. So when you take away the false self, by dismantling it, the narcissist re-experiences, lives through, you remember the, the video about flashbacks? Revividness re relieves his traumas. 
But this time, he's an adult. I take away his false self. He re-experiences his traumas because he has no protection left. It's like taking away the shell from a, from a turtle. He, he becomes a tortoise, a turtle without a shell. And so he re-experiences the harshness of reality, the injuries, the mortifications, the traumas, the narrative, the, 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 the disparaging narratives, the sadistic, hateful introjects. He experiences suddenly all this and he has zero protection because he has no grandiosity and no false self. But this time he's an adult. And so this time he can try to make sense out of his harrowing, horrible life experiences. He can construct a new narrative that is not delusional that is reality-based, that makes sense and gives his life structure, order, direction, meaning, and purpose. This is the core of cold therapy. It's forcing the narcissist, forcing the depressive patient to let go, to let go of a dysfunctional, delusional, sick, constricting, uh, crippling, uh, meaning-generating narrative Get rid of it, trash it, and then bravely and courageously face the pain, the fountain, the tsunami of pain and hurt and damage and shame and guilt to some extent. Have to face it and have to integrate it in a new story, in a new narrative that makes sense and would continue to make sense. Now in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, they more or less force you to do the same, to go through the same path of letting go of your grandiosity and then having to face the people you've hurt during your alcoholic bouts, the damage you have caused, and then to integrate all this into a narrative of healing and recovery. It all boils down to the same, effectively. Get rid of dysfunctional pathological defenses deficits, biases, get rid, stop renouncing reality, stop, as Cleckley called it, rejecting life, embrace life, embrace who you are, flawed and invalid as you are, accept yourself, nurture and parent yourself or reparent yourself, extricate yourself, this time with your own power, out of the trauma of your early childhood and heal. Heal via meaning, which leads us to the last treatment modality, and by far the most dominant and important, and that's logotherapy. Logotherapy uh, was invented by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl had the most amazing story. He, was, he survived in Auschwitz, the in, indescribable hell on earth, an inferno reified and embodied in Poland, a concentration and extermination camp. Most people were lucky, were lucky or <laughs> unfortunate, to survive six months in Auschwitz. This guy, Viktor Frankl, survived for three and a half years. Three and a half years in hell with devils and demons in human form, SS guards, and so on. And he has emerged with lessons. He has emerged with his mental health largely intact, a bit, of grand, a bit of grandiosity there, but largely intact, and he leveraged his experiences to help humanity, and he invented logotherapy. Logotherapy, I'm quoting now from the, from the website of the Logotherapy Institute. Viktor Frankl's logotherapy is based on the premise that the human person is motivated by a will to meaning, an inner pull to find a meaning in life. The following list of tenets represents basic principles of logotherapy. 1. Life has meaning under all circumstances, even the most miserable ones, even in Auschwitz. Number 2. Our main motivation for living is our will to find meaning in life. Number 3. We have freedom. We have freedom to find meaning in what we do and what we experience, or at least in the stand that we take when we are faced with a situation of unchangeable suffering. How we react to suffering is in itself meaning or generates meaning. The human spirit referred to in logotherapy is defined as that which is uniquely human. 
though in no way opposed to religion, the term is not used in a religious sense. So how do we discover meaning? According to Franco, we can discover this meaning in life in three different ways. Number one, by creating a work or doing a deed. Creativity. Number two, by experiencing something or encountering someone. And number three, by the attitude we take toward unavoidable suffering. Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. On the meaning of suffering, Frankl gives the following example. Once, an elder, elderly old general practitioner consulted me, an old medical doctor consulted me, because of his severe depression. He could not overcome the loss of his wife, who had died two years before, and whom he had loved above all else. Now how could I help him? What should I tell him? I refrained from telling him anything, but instead I confronted him with a question. What would have happened, doctor, if you had died first and your wife would have had to survive you? Oh, he said, for her this would have been terrible, how she would have suffered. Whereupon I replied, you see, doctor, such a suffering has been spared her, and it is you who have spared her this suffering, but now you have to pay for it by surviving by mourning her. He said no word, but he shook my hand and calmly left the office. Viktor Frankl, vignette. All psychotherapies make a based, of course, on implicit or explicit assumptions, usually implicit philosophical, even metaphysical assumptions. We make assumptions when we, when we create a new psychotherapy, when I created my treatment modality, we, we make assumptions about what, is, what it is to be human, and more importantly, what it is to be a person. In other words, what it is to have a personality, to be distinguished, to be an individual. Is there such a thing? Some treatment modalities dispute it. They say individuals are not atoms, they are not divorced from their environment. There's no such thing as individual. That's a Western invention. So there's a lot of debate, and psychotherapies clash in their description of their subject matter, the patient or the client. None of these assumptions can be proven with certainty. It's not a science. It's literature at best and bad metaphysics at worst. The assumptions of logotherapy include the following. The human, the human being is an entity consisting, consisting of body, mind and spirit. So that excludes logotherapy for me, for example. Because I would never, I, I, I'm a scientist by training. I, my original academic degrees are in physics. I cannot accept the concept of spirit. Things I cannot define don't exist for me. But it may apply to the vast majority of humanity who do believe in souls, spirits, ghosts, demons, and I don't know what else. So this is one assumption of logotherapy. Assumption number two, life is meaning under all circumstances, even the most miserable. Even if when millions of people are exterminated in front of your eyes in a horrible wintry camp in the middle of nowhere in Poland, Auschwitz. Number three, people have a will to meaning. They want meaning, like Adler's will to power and Freud's will to pleasure. Indeed, Frankl suggested that this is the third school of psychoanalysis, this will to meaning. And number four, people have freedom under all circumstances, to activate the will to find meaning. Number five, life has a demand quality to which people must respond if decisions are to be meaningful. And number six, the individual is unique, which of course reflects biases of, of Western thinking, of the Enlightenment, biases that started in the 17th and 18th century and reached their apex in the 19th and 20th century. The concept of the individual, which is alien, alien to cultures and societies, for example, in Asia and in some parts of Africa. So this is highly Western, it's Western-centered. The first assumption deals with the body, soma, the mind, psyche, and the spirit, nous, nous. According to Frankl, the body and the mind are what we have, and the spirit is what we are. Assumption number two is ultimate meaning. This is difficult to grasp, but it is something everyone experiences, and it represents an order 
in a world with laws that go beyond human laws. It's not the laws of nature. These are metaphysical laws, sometimes translated, sometimes they appear in the form of religion. But even when you're not religious, even when you're agnostic like me, or you have the religion of atheism, you're a non-deistic religious person, or your, your religion is science, even then, there are these unspoken, unspoken laws, kind of ambient, ambient canon, codex, of how, how the world behaves, the, the etiquette of existence, if you wish. The third assumption is seen as our main motivation for living and acting. When we see meaning, we are ready for any type of suffering. <clears throat> this is considered to be different than our will to achieve power and pleasure. Assumption four is that we are free to activate our will to find meaning. And this can be done under any circumstances. This deals with change of attitudes about unavoidable fate. Frankel was able to test the first four assumptions when he was confined in the concentration camps and successfully so. Let me tell you this, any psychotherapy that helped someone survive Auschwitz is worth considering. The fifth assumption, the meaning of the moment, is more practical in daily living than ultimate meaning. Unlike ultimate meaning, the meaning of the moment can be found and fulfilled. This can be done by following the values of society or by following the voice of our, con our conscience. Not much of a difference, by the way. Our conscience is internalized society. It's in introjected via the process of socialization. The sixth assumption deals with one's sense of meaning. This is enhanced by the realization that we are irreplaceable, unique. In essence, all humans are unique with an entity of body, mind and spirit. We all go through unique situations. We are constantly looking to find meaning. We are free to do this at all times in response to certain demands. Viktor Frankl, like Sigmund Freud, was a neurologist, but unlike Sigmund Freud, he was also a psychiatrist. And he believed that the primary motivational force is meaning in life. He believes that if you're motivated by money, if you're motivated by sex or power, your motivation will not last long and it will, it will not sustain you as a, as a functional integrated entity. Meaning does this. Meaning is the glue that holds everything together. And when you look at models, models of the psyche, when parts in these models interact, and I'm not only talking about Freud's tripartite model, I'm talking about Jung's model. I'm not only talking about psychoanalytic or psychodynamic models or object relations models, any model, including behaviorist models. They necessitate meaning. A leads to B. This teleology is, to some extent, embedded. A leads to B, because A needs to do something to B, or with B, in order to achieve C. There is, uh, one. If, if I were religious, I would say that there's a mind, a designer. But, of course, evolution gives a sufficient answer for this, and God is, an, as Pascal said, an un unnecessary assumption. So, logotherapy is, in many respects, existential. I mean, belongs to the school of existentialism. And it is openly, I mean, Frankl admits that he derived it from Kierkegaard's will to meaning. And Alfred Adler was influenced by Nietzsche, Nietzsche's will to power while Frankl was influenced by Kierkegaard and his will to meaning. Freud was influenced by Bloiler and others, and he came with a will to pleasure. Logotherapies says that you must, you always strive to find meaning in life. This is the most primary, most foundational, most powerful motivating and driving force. And I advise you to read the book, Men's Search for Meaning, which is the accessible because Fr uh, Frankl has many technical, highly obtuse and complicated books, which I also recommend to read. I mean, they're very, very important. But if you want to get the gist of it, and how shall I say, the spirit of it, then man search for me. In, in this book, he outlines how his theories helped him to survive the Holocaust 
and how his experience, how he developed his experience, and how he generated his, his theories. Logotherapy, of course, is based, I mean, it's, it's, these are two words, logos and, and therapy. So logos is reason. Logos is also word. So logos is language. Logos is reason. Logos is the mind of God in action. If you read the New Testament, uh, the first sentences about the logos. So he says that, that people are motivated by the logos. When they look at the world, when they look at the universe, there are two ways to look at your environment. Either you look at it and it's totally chaotic, totally random, totally meaningless, has no direction, purpose, and you say to yourself, when I see meaning, when I see direction, when I see purpose, I'm imposing myself on the universe. The universe is not like that. That's a delusion. These narratives are all, you know, BS, because it's me, I'm inventing them. And if I'm the source of these narratives, you know, they don't really, they don't, they don't give real meaning. These narratives reflect more about my inner state, about my inner landscape, about my mental uh, structures, constructs, intrajects, than about reality. They say nothing about reality. And if I force reality, shoehorn reality to conform into these narratives, I'm just lying to myself. So that's one way of looking at the universe. And another way of looking at the universe is, is the way Frankl does, saying that, yeah, humans are the source of meaning, but that doesn't mean that meaning is meaningless. The fact that we are the source doesn't vitiate, negate, or undermine the, the power of meaning, the importance of meaning, and above all, the validity of meaning. We can come up with narratives which are meaningful and these meanings will be sustained by reality. Science. What is science? Science is a set of narratives. Who creates science? We do. Only we do. I have yet to come across a giraffe who, create, who creates relativity theory. Humans create science. And yet, Science resonates with the universe. The universe agrees, complies, obeys, follows science. Of course, it's a way of looking at it. The science makes sense of the universe, imbues it with some form of operational meaning, charts it, maps it, creates maps of meaning, to borrow from Jordan Peterson. So, science is an example of an, a meaningful narrative which is essentially human, only human, exclusively human, but still has its own standalone validity, independent of the source. And so if we can do it with science, why can't we do it with metaphysics or philosophy? Or you know what? Perish the thought, religion. The human spirit imbues the work of Frankl. But his use of the word spirit is not spiritual. It's not religious. The spirit is the will what Kierkegaard called the will. That's the spirit. It's the search for meaning. It's not a search for God. It's not a search for any supernatural being. It's not a search for the paranormal. The search for meaning, on the contrary, is very pedestrian, is very quotidian, is very detail-oriented, is very... You search for meaning in your routine, in your daily life, in the people that surround you day in and day out or zoom, zoom with you, day in and day out. You search for meaning in the virus. You search for meaning in the, in, in the sick wards, in hospitals. You search for meaning in the trenches where millions of people die. You search for meaning in hunger. You search for meaning in love. You search for meaning in your children and your spouse and your boring and dull work. You don't search for meaning in, in heavens. You don't search for meaning in the, in the kingdom of heaven that is about to come or in the second coming or in any guru or prophet or public intellectual. Or you don't search for meaning in these places. You search for meaning within yourself. Within yourself. Um, he, Frankl warned against affluence, hedonism, materialism in the search for meaning. He said that these are these are gods with 
their feet of clay. They, they, they're idols in the biblical sense. And their prophets are false prophets, all these coaches and, and so on. Frankel observed that it's actually psychologically damaging when our search for meaning is thwarted, blocked, frustrated, deformed, manipulated. Althusser, Louis Althusser, with his interpolation. So positive life purpose, positive meaning is, is, could be uh, associated with strong religious belief or membership in some group or dedication to a cause or upholding certain life values and reifying them in your behavior, having clear goals. Um, purpose of life, adult develop, uh, developing into an adult, maturing into an adult implies having a purpose, having a structure, channeling, having a direction. And yes, in many respects, it implies narrowing your life. Channeling means being limited to a channel. And this is what Cleckley describes in his book, Mask of Sanity. Psychopaths, even gifted ones, even geniuses, and he, he dedicates a whole chapter to gifted psychopaths. Their problem is not that they're stupid, or even that they are insane, although he claims that they are functionally insane. Their problem is that they, they reject life. They reject life in the sense that they refuse to adhere to any purpose, and any meaning, and any direction, and any order. They are defined. In psychopathy, we call it reactance. Psychopaths are react, reactant. They have defiance, and they sacrifice their own them, they, they would rather die than succumb, than accept the mores and edicts and expectations of society, of peers, of family, of institutions. They'd rather die, and they often die. So, psychopathy is the rejection of meaning. The rejection of meaning, the rejection of maturation, and the rejection of life. Because to do this, you must comprehend life's purpose. You must direct it. You must have intention. Life is intentionality. Intentionality creates the feeling that life is meaningful. And there were many other scholars like Crumbo, Maholik, and they designed even something called the purpose of life, purpose in life test, the PIL test. It measures individuals' meaning and purpose in life. And they found that in various studies that meaning in life mediated relationship between religiosity and well-being, for example, between stress, uncontrollable stress, and substance abuse, depression, and self-derogation, etc., etc. They discovered that meaning is super critical. Seeking of noetic goals test, song, it's another measure that they, they had designed, and song measures the orientation towards meaning. So PIL measures the existence of meaning. Song measures orientation to find meaning, the drive to find meaning. So when you have a low score on PIL, you have low meaning in your life or no meaning in your life, and you have a high score on song, that's a better, that predicts a better outcome in treatment than, than the opposite. Um, Freud um, uh, Frankel himself suggested various ways of obtaining, obtaining meaning, and I, I quoted, I referred you to, to this, and I described the case of the general practitioner, the medical doctor, and, and so on and so forth. But like Jordan Peterson much later, Frankel emphasizes suffering. And of course, Jordan Peterson continues a very long tradition of debate about suffering. Buddhism is one way of considering suffering. Christianity, of course, is founded on suffering. Christianity is suffering reified. It's institutionalized suffering. Uh, especially in its more original forms, which is Catholicism. Um, strangely, Orthodox Christianity is centered around life and meaning, while Catholic Catholicism chose suffering and the negation of life, the denial of life. One could argue that perhaps Catholicism is far more psychopathic than other variants of Christianity. But let's not go into this. It's another video. But, Frankel similarly 
realize the value of suffering. And he said that suffering is meaningful only, and here he's, he's distinct from Peterson, he disagrees with Peterson. He said suffering is valuable, but only when first two creative possibilities are not available. In other words, when nothing else is available, when you can't create, when you can't be with people, when you can't socialize, when you can't do anything, when you're in a concentration camp, in other words, when your locus of control is totally external, your life is not your own, only then your suffering becomes meaningful. When Roman legionnaires march you through Jerusalem and then crucify you, you are utterly powerless. You're utterly helpless. You're utterly impotent. At that point, your suffering becomes meaningful, but only at that point. Because prior to that point, you have alternatives. And all alternatives are preferable to suffering. Frankel said that suffering is not meaningless if it can be avoided. Only when suffering is inevitable, he beca it becomes meaningful. So he was very he was dead set against suffering. And in this sense, he was a Buddhist, of course. We'll talk about it in one of our next videos. He wrote another book, which I recommend to you. It's, it's a bit more complex. And it's called The Will to Meaning, Foundations and Applications of Logotherapy. That's the philosophy and metaphysics of logotherapy. He makes some, some amazingly basic observations in this book that have eluded and evaded the greatest minds in psychology. For example, well, his opening sentence is essentially, there's no psychotherapy if we don't have a theory of the individual. He, he was, remember, he was an existentialist and he disagreed with behaviorism. He disagreed that people are machines or that they are uh, evolved uh, rats. Like if you experiment on rats in a laboratory, you learn everything you have, you learn everything you need to know about, about humans. He disagreed. He said that the difference between rats and humans is not a question of quantity. It's a question of quality. And he said that behaviorism is anti-human. It undermines the human quality of humans. He was a neurologist and he was a psychiatrist. And so when you couple these essentially mechanistic disciplines, because neurology is mechanistic. It's a, it's a machine. It's studying the machine, the machinery, the hardware of the brain. So when you couple this with existentialism, you come up with the equivalent of determinism. But how do you reconcile determinism with freedom of will or the will to freedom or the will to meaning? So there is an inherent time bomb in logotherapy. Frankl admits that a person can never be free from every condition. People are subjected to, to start with physiological, biological, medical conditions, and then they're subjected to sociological, cultural conditions, and then they are subjected to psychological determinants. I mean, people are under so many um, constraints and that it's very difficult to assert yourself, to exert yourself separately from these constraints. In, in, with many, many people, the constraints and the limitations and the rules become their identity. Their identity is comprised of what they cannot do, not what they can do. So he says that people are capable of resisting and braving even the worst conditions. He, he said you, you, must, you must rebel against these constraints. You must detach from the situation. You must choose an attitude. You must determine your own determinants. You must shape your own character. You must become responsible for yourself. You must fight, fight back. A.K. Homo is a method used in logotherapy and it requires the therapist to note the innate strengths that people have and how they have dealt with adversity and suffering in life. Despite everything a person may have gone through, they made the best of their suffering. And this is the Eke Homo. Behold the man. The man. And 
his story. Behold the meaning that each and every one of us generates to a lesser or greater degree. Okay, assignments, I remind you, all your studies are meaningless without assignments. And what's even much worse, I'm meaningless without your assignments. So don't make me lose my job in this pandemic because, you know, it's the only one I have. It's the thing that gives my life, endows my life with meaning. You wouldn't want to take this away from me. Thank you for listening. I received complaints from some Shoshanim that they had been discarded and replaced with baby seals and baby sealets. Worry not, my Shoshanim, you're always in my heart. You're the first and foremost. So, here goes. Okay, Shoshanim. Today, we're going to deal with narrative. Narrative is our core identity. And what happens when narratives fail and how to fix them? My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I am also a professor of psychology in CIAPS, Center for International Advanced Professional Studies, the outreach program of the CIAS Consortium of Universities. <laughs> that was long, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. Disorders of the self, narcissism, borderline, can be easily construed as failures of narratives, failures of self stories. Now, you know my view, I don't believe there is such a thing as a unitary, stable, immutable self uh, across the lifespan. I believe that people have an assemblage of self states which respond to and resonate with environmental stimuli and changes. But whichever the case may be, self states, self, they have to be organized in a way which would make sense to the individual. They have to be put together somehow, according to some script, some story. And this story about yourself, who are you? Where are you headed to? What's the meaning of your life? What are your greatest aspirations? What are your hopes? What are your fears? All these put together in a coherent, cohesive framework is what is known as self-narrative. In narcissism, the narrative breaks down. There's a failure of narrative because the narcissist adopts a story about himself or herself, which has little to do with reality. The story is unrealistic. It's counterfactual. It's fantastic, very often grandiosely fantastic, but not only. For example, the shared fantasy is a narrative failure. The narrative, the self-narrative, has to be self-efficacious. It is intended to help us to survive. It, has an evolution, it is an evolutionary positive adaptation. Narratives that divorce us from reality, for example, a psychotic narrative or a narcissistic narrative, these narratives are narrative failures. It's the same in, in borderline. In borderline, we have identity disturbance. There is no fixed core. There's no identity. It's like a cloud, ephemeral, ever-changing, shape-shifting. You can't pinpoint or pin down the borderline. There's nobody there in the sense that everybody is there. <laughs> The borderline changes sometimes within hours. Everything about her, including her values and beliefs and hopes and wishes and dreams, everything changes. And the borderline switches between self states, rapidly cycles to the point that she is not. In both narcissism and borderline, we have a situation of absence. These are disorders of absence. 
the in both of them there's an empty schizoid core kind of black hole which does not contain any continuous contiguous uh, jointed information everything it's as if some improvised explosive device detonated amidst what should have been a core a kernel of identity and these are narrative failures now there is something called narrative psychology and there is something called narrative therapy where we try to fix narratives it's a form of psychotherapy we help patients to identify values and skills which are associated with them we provide the patient with some kind of knowledge or ability to experience these values and to exercise these skills in order to confront problems and so the way we do this is we encourage self-authorship we encourage the patient to co-author with a therapist a new narrative about themselves and the patient does this by investigating the history of his or her values the continuity of his or her skills narrative therapy is closely associated with other therapies for example collaborative therapy and person-centered therapy there are several techniques in narrative therapy we start with reoffering identity the narrative therapist focuses on assisting the patient to create sto a story about himself i'm going to use the the male gender pronoun but of course it applies to women as well so the patient is encouraged to write a story about himself about his identity but the story has to be helpful in some way it has to cope with some issue or problem or repetition compulsion and the work of this reoffering one's identity helps the patients to identify values skills knowledge to to exercise in order to live these values and so on and so forth the therapist just listens and questions and directs this process of authorship having identified or having pinned down or realized the personal history and the values attached to this personal history now the patient is is able to write a new narrative or to co-author a new narrative the problem usually starts when there is a discrepancy between the narrative that a person tells himself and the stories that other people tell about the person when there is a clash or a conflict or dissonance between what people say and think about you and what you say and think about yourself this is very common in narcissism and that's why narcissists have a grandiosity defense grandiosity is co a cognitive distortion intended to uphold a fantasy intended to prevent a dissonant a dissonance between self-narrative and narratives about you um, from other people and so the story of someone's identity determines not only who you are at any given moment but also your potential for self-actualization what do you believe is possible for yourself in other words your self-narrative defines your horizon the narrative process allows you to identify values that are important to you use your skills and integrate your knowledge but it is always focused on unique outcomes it's a phrase coined by Irving Goffman unique outcomes expectations or exceptions to the problem that wouldn't be predicted by the problem's narrative or story whenever we are faced with a problem and I recommend that you watch my previous videos video about solving dilemmas whenever you are faced with a problem the problem itself is a narrative and usually embedded in the problem there's some form of catastrophizing the problem actually communicates to you I cannot be solved or you are not good enough to solve me and so 
rewriting or reauthoring your story creates unique outcomes um, in the sense that you find a way to solve the problem. You find an exception to the problem's overriding message, I am unresolvable. Another technique is called externalizing conversation. Narrative therapy is about constructing self-narratives, but of course self-narrative self -narrative is a very important part, a very important component of core identity. So the approach um, in narrative therapy is not to conflate identities with self-narratives and not to mistake problems with identities. That is very, very reminiscent of the way cognitive behavior therapy treats automatic negative thoughts. Automatic negative thoughts are narratives, in effect, or mini narratives. But the message of automatic negative thoughts is you cannot cope with your problems. They're never going to go away because your problems are who you are. Your problems are not just mistakes you have made, but they reflect on who you are. And so in narrative therapy, we teach the patient to separate narrative about who they are, self-story, from problems and issues in life, which have to do more with actions, choices, and decisions, not with who you are. The approach seeks to avoid, actually, the notion that the self um, is kind of biologically determined that there is something like a true nature, a quiddity, an essence that you cannot escape. It's a bit deterministic, it's a bit fatalistic, and narrative therapy is the opposite of deterministic and fatalistic. It tells you, you can rewrite yourself, you can reinvent yourself, you can become someone different just by sheer willpower, imagination, and creativity. We separate in narrative therapy identities, self-narratives, from problems. And we do this by externalizing conversations. The process of externalizing allows people to consider their relationships with their problems. And so externalizing focuses on your strengths, on your positive attributes, and allows you to construct and perform a new preferred identity, which is essentially a kind of positive psychology, if you wish. An externalizing emphasis is about naming a problem, getting a handle on it, so that a person can assess the problem's effects in his or her life, can analyze how the problem operates or works in his or her life, and can end uh, the relationship with the problem they can simply choose to disengage from the problem, ignore it in a way, or engage with it in a totally new way from a point of strength, emphasizing assets rather than liabilities. And this leads usually to something uh, which a prominent narrative therapist, Michael White, had developed. It's called the Statement of Position Map. The therapist is collaborating with the patient. It's a therapeutic posture. He doesn't impose ideas on the patient. He doesn't give the patient advice. He just, together with the patient, explores the patient's life and history, personal history, autobiography. Together, they uncover and examine a life unexamined. They remember things past to borrow from another Jew, Marcel Proust. Michael White developed a conversation map, which by the way is, is somewhat reminiscent to the map of happiness in cold therapy. So he developed a conversation map called a statement of position map. It is designed to elicit the client's own evaluation of the problems and the developments in their life. The therapist and the client are perceived as having some kind of valuable information relevant to the process. And they create together, they co-create, they're co-creators, they co-create the content of the therapeutic conversation 
by imbuing it and suffusing it with this valuable information. The therapist has valuable information about healing. The patient has valuable information about the patient. So there's a position, there's a position of curiosity. The therapist is curious about the patient. The patient is curious about what the therapist might have to say, may have to say, and they collaborate. And there's an implicit message. You already have everything you need to transform your life. You have all the skills, you have all the values, you have all the knowledge to solve the problems that you're facing. Even if you have identity disturbance, you can leverage, you can leverage your kaleidoscopic nature. You can leverage this instability, this constant shape-shifting. These are not necessarily liabilities. These could be construed and used as assets in a new self-narrative or self-story, which is not deprecatory, not self-critical, and does not necessarily adhere or conform to social mores and so on. When people develop solutions to their own problems based on their own values, on their traits, on their decisions, choices, and behavior, on their personal history, they own the process. They become much more committed to implementing these solutions. A practice, a common practice in narrative therapy is remembering. The therapy identifies identities that are somehow sublimated, identities that are socially conformant or reflect somehow or denote social accomplishments and achievements. And the practice of remembering um, kind of puts together these identities which are socially condoned. It tries to coalesce them to support a person's preferred story about themselves. It disengages the identities that do not support the person. Again, very reminiscent of how cognitive behavior therapy deals with automatic negative thoughts and similarly in Gestalt. Michael White was actually, um, is actually a proponent of Jacques Derrida and he draws on his work. White was curious about the values that were, were implicit in people's pain, sense of failure and um, actions which are self-destructive and self-defeating. What kind of values can motivate these? Why would have anyone have a value or set of values which causes which causes self-destruction. Why would anyone seek pain in a way by adopting certain values? Where does the sense of failure come from? If you do follow your values, you should feel great. You should feel egocentric. You should feel accomplished because you have been following your values. So why don't you? Why don't you? Why do you feel so bad ultimately? People feel pain or failure in relation to their values or how they would prefer their relationships or life to be. Um, th these are kind of stalled initiatives that people take in life. And they are also guided by implicit values, by rendering the hidden text overt, the implicit text explicit. By doing this, we actually bring to awareness conflicts, dissonances, and internal problems. Another map in narrative therapy, narrative therapy is very, very big on, on maps. <laughs> so another map is called the outside, outsider witnesses map. It's a, again, everything in narrative therapy is a conversation between the therapist and the patient. This is a narrative practice. It's a practice of telling stories to each other. Sometimes outsider witnesses are invited as listeners in the consultation. It could be, I don't know, parents, good friends, enemies, spouses. Spouses are enemies. Okay, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> People from the outside. So they are brought into the into the room, into the counseling process. 
and then they um, they are asked to contribute. They are asked to contribute to the weaving of this of this yarn of this um, uh, quilt to the weaving of this emerging story and it is beautiful beautiful to behold the narrative process as it gives rise to a totally new identity and self story which are much more helpful and beneficial to the client when outsiders are invited to the um, counseling or consultation room and by the way some outsiders could be for example cl other clients of the therapist who have gone through the process and they have knowledge and experience of the problem at hand there's no limit or limitation on who is allowed into into the room during the consultation and so these people participate and it becomes a community effort very similar to group therapy in a way and during the first interview between the therapist and the patient um, even during the first interview sometimes there's an outsider the outsider listens without commenting it's it's in order to be seen the outsider's gaze helps the patient see himself or herself through an outsider's gaze maybe for the first time the patient is really seen um, the usual the usual protocol for the involvement of outsiders in narrative therapy is to um, instruct them not to criticize the patient not to evaluate the patient not to rank the patient or give him or her marks and um, not to make proclamations uh, opinionated proclamations about what they've just heard or what they've just seen outsiders are simply asked to say what phrase or image stood out for them in the narrative or the newly emergent narrative they're asked to follow resonances between their own life struggles and the problems and issues they have just witnessed the outsider is asked in what ways they may feel a shift in how they experience themselves from when they first entered the room it is intended to demonstrate to the patient that every human interaction creates a shift every human interaction has an effect every human interaction hurts or elates nothing and no one is isolated we're all relational and so any narrative and self story we may come up with has to take into account other people the therapist turns to the consulting to the patient the patient has been listening all the while to the outsider and then the therapist turns to him and interviews him about what images or phrases stood out in the conversation just heard and what resonances have struck a chord with with the patient so there is an, a kind of intermediation the therapist becomes a facilitator or a moderator between the inputs of the outsider and the inputs of the patient and the resonances and interactions between these two inputs in the at the end an outsider witness conversation is very rewarding it's very re rewarding not only for the patient but for the outsider as well the outcomes are often remarkable when the where the patient is concerned they learn that they're not the only one with this problem for example they acquire new images and knowledge about the problem and they can they choose an alternative direction in life the main aim of narrative therapy is to engage people with their problems by providing them with alternative better or best solutions which are essentially new self stories new identities new self narratives and everything is documented everything is written down exactly as an author would do only this is a process of self-authorship with a guide or a facilitator so the person and the counselor they co-author uh, certificates there is for example a graduation from the blues certificate about overcoming depression sometimes case notes are created collaboratively with clients to provide documentation 
as, as, as well as markers of progress, I do the same in cold therapy. Rewriting who you are is a first step, not a last one. When you are faced with situations in life which are intractable, when you feel hopeless, when you feel there's nowhere to go, when you feel that it is your essence that is compromising your life, when you feel that who you are is the problem, then of course you need to change who you are. And here's the good news. You have the power to do so because you are nothing but a dream. You are nothing but a storyline. You are nothing but a movie or a script or a theater play. You can rewrite yourself. You are the author of yourself and you are the exclusive author of your own life. And people are out there and they can provide you with sufficient input to guide you, calibrate you. Even evil people, people with ill intentions, they provide you with valuable input. They are part and parcel of the learning curve and experience. It's a teaching moment every moment. So trust your ability to become someone else and trust the world to provide you with inputs and feedback which will keep you on track, which will allow you to gauge whether you are doing the right thing. Do not discard anything, information or data that comes from the world. All these stimuli, all these inputs are critical for your self-betterment, healing, or at the very least, enhanced self-efficacy in solving problems. Gradually, you will discover that you do have stable values, even as a borderline. Gradually, you will find out that reconstructing your narrative has amazing effects, not only on who you are, but on what's happening to you. And this is true even for narcissists. Cold therapy is actually a variant of narrative therapy, where we write out grandiosity and replace it with a self-narrative that is realistic and allows for enhanced self-efficacy in interpersonal relationships. Thank you for listening.